So my name is Usman Allu, and I am the programs coordinator at CARE SFBA, Council of American Islamic Relations. I will be um, everyone's main point of contact throughout the entirety of the program. Um, so remember me, you all. Um, and I'll be here every week also for each session. And then I'm joined by my colleague Aisha, if you want to introduce yourself. Please. Sure. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, I'm Aisha Hamid. Uh, I've been with this program since it got launched, like five, six years ago. So it's been a it's always a privilege to come back and do the opening session. Uh, and I've been the, I came to U.S. about 12 years ago. I'll tell a little bit about myself. There's an exercise we're going to do together so I can speak a little bit about, more about myself. But from a statistics perspective, I um, I'm, uh, work for a company called Genentech in the Bay Area. Some of you may have heard about it. Some of you may have not. I am one of the head of informatics. I've been with the company for 12 years. And it's always, like I said, a privilege to come back and work with you all. Looking forward to this session. Yeah, awesome. And just a few uh, kind of um, ground rules here. So in everybody's binders, uh, we should have uh, quite a few materials in there. Um, if everyone can open them up to the first page there, inshallah. So that first page is kind of our general list of the list of sessions that we will be having um, and the different topics for them. I just want to note that um, July 10th is Eid, inshallah, so that's the one day that we won't be meeting. But for these other sessions, they're all listed there. And I also want to list out that um, the fourth session on uh, June 26th, so I want to make sure everyone knows it's going to be a field trip that we have. So I'll send out materials for that um, and next week, inshallah, I just want to make sure everybody knows. And then we also have our uh, attendance policy on belief um, in the binder as well. And for that, um, please, if you are, you know, if you find that you can't make a session, please let me know. Please contact me um, and just let me know from beforehand. And then we also have a form on here as well for you and your parents as well. It's a media form. And for that, um, just want we just um, have to make sure that everyone signs it. That way we can um, record media and uh, we can post as well. So also important. And what else we've got? And yeah, and then a little bit of introduction for the program. Uh, so Muslim Game Changers Network was created in 2014. So it's been quite a few years now, um, and it's, it was created in LA with our, care, with our care branch there. And our curriculum was developed by young professionals and activists from our community who wanted to pass on the knowledge um, they gained through their organizing experience to prepare the next generation of Muslim activists to be smarter, better, and more grounded um, in faith. And the goal is to help participants understand the social and political context of their own experiences to explore their community history and gain practical tools to develop Muslim servant leaders who are equipped to challenge the status quo. And then, yeah, um, I'm going to go ahead and give everyone a ch And now we're going to go ahead and have everyone introduce themselves for me really quick, too. Um, I know there's quite a few of us, so just name uh, a little bit of background and why you decided to um, join MGN this year. Sure. I mean, you can, we can start there, then we can pass it down? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Asalaamu Alaikum. My name is Nuha Muflahi. I'm a freshman, and um, the reason why I joined is because I'm interested in activism, but I just don't know where to start. So, thank you. Um, Assalamu alaikum. My name is also Nuha. It's Nuha Fayaz. And um, I'm a sophomore, and I joined MGN because um, I wanted to do something productive with my summer, and I felt that this program was it. Um, my name is Janna, and I'm, I'm going to be in ninth grade. And I joined MGN because I wanted to develop some skills that could help me in the future. Hi, my name is Rabia, and um, I'm going to go to ninth grade, and um, I just want to learn more about how I can help community. Thank you. Um, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Aisha, 
Um, I'm a freshman and I wanted to join this program because I wanted to, you know, do something with my summer and I wanted to learn more about my religion. So, like, uh, my name is Anaya and I'm a sophomore and I joined MGN because I wanted to be more knowledgeable about activism. My name is Madiha and I just completed my ninth grade year. I joined this program because my mom's a lawyer and I've always wanted to be a lawyer and I feel that social justice is the root of it, so. Assalamu alaikum, my name's Safwan. I just graduated from Cal High and I'll be starting college in the fall, so I wanted to develop my identity and make sure that I have a toolbox of stuff to do when I have to be on my own there. Mm, excited, congratulations. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Omar, I'm a freshman and I joined because I figured that I could learn some skills that could be useful in the future. Awesome. Uh, my name is Daoud. I'm a junior and I joined because I wanted to learn more about Muslim activism. Great, thank you. Assalamualaikum, my name is Rizwan. I'm a junior also and I joined MGN because I wanted to stand up for what's, what's right in the community. Thank you. Alaikum. my name is Rayan. I'm a freshman and I joined because I wanted to do something with my summer and learn. Uh, Asalaamu Alaikum, I'm a sophomore from Dublin and I joined because I want to do something productive over the summer. Asalaamu Alaikum, my name is Hassan, I am going into ninth grade. I joined because I want to have some leadership skills. Welcome. Asalaamu Alaikum, my name is Hoon and I joined because my current summer plans are kind of boring, so I might as well spice things up. Welcome. Asalaamu Alaikum, my name is Jibriel and um, I joined, I'm going to be a sophomore. I joined because I want to learn more about Muslim rights. So, welcome. Uh, my name is Hansa. Uh, going into 10th grade, uh, I joined because it sounded interesting. So. Uh, my name is Yusuf. I just finished 9th grade. Uh, I joined because I'm interested in politics, and uh, I thought this was a good way to explore that. Welcome. My name is Eyes, and I'm a junior, and I joined because I wanted to make good use of my free time during summer. My name is Nuha, I'm going into ninth grade, and I joined because I wanted to learn more about current issues and how to help around the community. Welcome. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, my name is Zara, and I'm going to be a senior, and I wanted to join to learn more about like social justice and like trying to do something more productive over the summer. Welcome. Um, my name is Raina, I'm going to be a freshman, and I joined because I'm interested in activism. Welcome. Um, my name is Halima. I'm going to be a senior and I joined because I just wanted to get more involved in the community. Uh, my name is Jenna. I'm also going to be a senior and I joined because pretty much all the topics covered in here sounded really interesting. Welcome. Uh, my name is Hamza. I'm going to 10th grade and I joined here because I wanted to meet new people. Welcome. We're just doing a quick round of intros. Why did you join MGM? Um, like I'm Hannah, and I did this because, oh, I'm 14 years old, and I did this because I wanted to do something productive. Uh, my name is Zaid. I'm 16 years old. I'm a rising senior in high school, and I also want to do something productive this summer. Awesome. Welcome, everyone. Wow, we got a packed house here today. Awesome. All right, so again, thank you all so much for your quick intros. I'm Aisha, I'm going to be a facilitator for today. And every week there's going to be a new facilitator. As much as I would love to stay with, throughout the whole journey with you guys, but um, it's going to be a new facilitator each week. So I'm, again, very honored and humbled to be here with all of you. I'm going to spend the next um, roughly 90 minutes with you all. So our first, um, you know, part of this whole session is Whenever we come together, especially in a community that's new to us, I personally like to set up some ground rules. Um, not just for the sake of having the discipline in the class, but just the respect, right, we have for each other. And we go, you're all going to be working together for quite some time now. So that's why it's good to set those rules up in advance so you would know when you're walking in, what stays in this room stays in this room, right? It's a safe space. So before we get into the actual work, uh, the actual work that we have to do here. Um, I'm going to help 
if you all can help me create what we call the being, this is definitely not the being. I'm not an artist, guys. I tried my best. So this is the closest I can get to the being. But if anybody can help me fill this in, it would be very helpful. And what I'm looking for is um, let's start from the inside. What do you all think you will need for the next couple of weeks while you're together to be productive, to grow together, and to make the most of this time? And if I can get a volunteer to help me fill that up, that would be awesome. Thank you. I was still gonna say I would, would have asked someone, but thank you. If you do you mind coming up? Yeah, thanks so much. Yusuf, yes, thank you. So you can take any marker if you want to, yeah. All right, so let's help Yusuf fill this one in. Uh, what attitudes or behaviors do you think would be helpful to create a safe space for this group? I can give the first one if that's okay. Respect. You can write anywhere inside, yeah. Can you take another one? This marker's all dried up, sorry. Thank you. This one too? Really? Okay. You can go with this one. I think these two are working, so. What else do you all think we need? Yes. An open mind. Thank you. What else? Yes. Diverse perspectives. I love that. Thank you. What else? Yes. Kindness. Thank you. I love that. Yes. Positivity. Okay, we got two. Awesome. What else? Curiosity. I'm sure there's something else you guys would like. Anything? I love that. Thank you. Anything else? Welcome. Sorry, we're just go setting some ground rules. Um, so you just walked in. Just want to let you know. Empathy. Yes. No judgment. I love that. Thank you. Welcome. So we're just setting some ground rules. Um, you haven't missed much. And those who walked in, maybe you can get take a couple of minutes just to introduce yourselves. Would that be OK? All right. Yes. Collaboration. Thank you. And those who are not comfortable saying out loud, it's completely okay. You guys can fill it up during your lunch break or anything. You feel like you need to add in there. It's all good. Before we go to what you do not want to come into this room, is there anything else you want to add?
I'll take that as a no for now. But like I said, you're more than welcome to come up and write whatever you like just to help you, you know, make these next couple of weeks more and more productive. All right, so let's go on to the second part of this exercise. What would you like not to come into this room when you guys are together? Animosity? So it's going to be outside the being. Yeah. You can use any other color. There are more, there are more markets here, if you like. Yes. I love that. Thank you. I like that. Yes. Bad manners. Thank you. What else? Yes. I love that. Thank you. What else? Yes. Anger. Thank you. Yes. Eight. It's a powerful one. What else? Anything else you'd like to add to this? Yusuf, would you like to add anything to it? Okay, and like I said, this will evolve, right? This will grow over time. You don't need to fill up the whole thing being right now, but this will stay up. You'll more, most likely see this one up throughout the classes. So um, feel free to come up, write it on your own, but it's kind of setting the context on that this is a safe space. Respect is something nobody will tolerate, and you guys will be working along together for the next couple of weeks. So it will really help grow that relationship as well. Thank you, Yusuf, so much. Really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. So we'll go on to the next part of this exercise. This is one of my favorite ones, by the way. It's called the journey maps. And if you open up your binders, there is going to be a page there that's completely blank and it's labeled as journey maps. And, in your journey, and on this, what we're hoping is either you can draw, you can write, whatever helps you express those three moments in your life. And it can be even more than three. I don't think I want to stick with three. It can be even more than three uh, moments in your life, defining moments in your life that have helped you to be the person you are today. Those can be moments of defeat, empowerments, or just moments that change your course in life. I'll be happy to share a couple of mine. And those are probably the most defeatful moments in my life, but yet the most powerful one, and I won't change a thing about it. Um, so when I, as I was introducing myself, before I do, I want to hear from you guys first, because you guys just joined us. And you guys are going to be here with us for a couple of weeks. Would you like to quickly introduce yourself and just your name, age, and why did you join MGN? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Mohammed. Uh, I'm 17, and I'll be doing, joining, doing senior year next year, inshallah. I joined, um, my parents signed me up, obviously, but uh, to I guess learn something new. Awesome, great. Welcome, Ahmed. Sorry, my name is Eunice, and I'm 15. Um, I joined as well because um, there's 
stuff that I just don't know about awesome. this area. Welcome. Can you join the Swallow Right Hand? Would you like to quickly introduce yourself? Um, I'm Aya. I'm 13 and I joined because I want to learn more about this and try to make a change. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you guys, really appreciate it. As I was saying, so I'll share a couple of my defining moments and then I would love to hear from, I would say all of you, but we'll see. We'll see how, time, how we're doing with time. And then we can try to get through as much as possible. Um, so when I was introducing myself earlier, yes, titles do matter. So like I had said, I am I work a company called Genentech. I've been with the company for now almost 12 years. I'm one of the heads of informatics, a very male dominated department, I must say. So it's an honor as a woman of color, as a Muslim woman, to be one of the leaders there. But that's just my title. To get there, it's been quite a remarkable journey. And um, every time, you know, when I'm asked that do I feel any fear coming up when you're speaking about yourself, and I will say every time, even though I've spoken quite a few times, every time I have fear coming up. Even right now, I can hear my heart beating. And it's, it's common, it's normal, it's a human reaction. But um, I was talking to my mom earlier this morning and I was like, oh gosh, what am I gonna to talk to them about? And all she said to me, there are people just like you, just like me. And I'm not gonna talk about my accomplishments and my, uh, all my education, how I did this and that, no, I think I want to talk to you about one of the most um, strongest emotion I still have a challenge with at this age and time, and that's fear. And how courage was one of the pillars I had to embrace uh, to these defining moments I'm going to share with all of you. So imagine a girl who was quite opposite to what her um, culture expected her to be. Uh, a girl that was told that a woman can never be a leader and that uh, education was something that she can dream of. And yes, I'm not in my 50s or 40s, I'm in my early 30s, but I lived through those times. And um, I imagine this girl who had to stand before a paternal grandfather was told that education is no, there's no use for her uh, and her sisters. And imagine this girl as a young adult who was called out uh, in her college back home and in, a, in a class of almost 80 men and five girls um, in an engineering class. And she was told that she was wasting her time here. Her kind should be at home cooking and cleaning. Um, but you know, life has um, different plans for you and life and Allah sends people towards you that you never imagined having and they help you be the person that you are today. And those two remarkable human beings have been my mother and my grandmother. I don't think I'll ever be able to find the right words to express what my mother has done for me and my sisters. But just in short that she has saved me in every possible way a girl can be saved. And my grandmother, um, all I'm gonna say is that she is my best friend. She'll always be my best friend. And um, she always reminded me that I am the son that my mother never had, uh, the warrior that she never had in my lowest points in my life. And I held those words and my mother's commitment to my education very close to my heart. So this girl did finally get to go to college and I think it was, I think it was my final year, yeah. It was in my final year when my marriage was arranged. And I'm gonna be honest, I was so excited. So excited that I'm gonna get, get, get to have my fairy tale wedding and my fairy tale marriage. I know guys, I was very young. I was 21 when that happened. And it was far from fairy tale. That's all I'm gonna say. It was far from fairy tale because it was the beginning of quite an abusive marriage. Um, I tried my best in every possible way I could to save that marriage, first of all. And career and um, ambition, oh, that was not even in my mind at that point. And everything, every time something fell apart, I always used to play, lay the blame on myself, that I need to fix this, it's my responsibility, I need to put this together. Yet it was something that wasn't just my own or something that I had to fix. But that's how I was. 
and I believe it was in 2008 when Fear and I came face to get face after quite some time and it was with the news that my best friend, my grandmother, was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. And I still remember that moment that it was hard to accept. It was hard to understand when you have so much of the losses going on, especially that time my marriage. So to accept that somebody who you love so much is going through this. But you know how um, we, just like everybody who's desperate to find cure for the cancer for their loved ones, um, we were desperate. We tried to get her right treatments. We tried everything. And we defeated cancer. Just like I had read in books, I was the warrior that she always imagined me to be. And we defeated cancer. And that was for a very limited time, for, um, it was in 20, 2009, when um, I was sitting by myself in my home after I had faced uh, not such a good scenario with my husband with an ice pack to my face. And I remember my aunt called me in the late hour. It was, I think, around 1 a.m. in the morning. And she, all I heard the words, uh, it's back, it's back. The cancer was back uh, six months after she got her first, uh, after the first time we actually defeated it. And I just couldn't comprehend what was going on. I just kept repeating these words to myself over and over again that, um, why her? She promised she'll be with me. Why is this happening to her? Why is this happening to me? Haven't I faced enough? And I still remember the last time when I spoke to her. She said something to me quite profounding, which I still look back and go like, I don't know how or where she knew that from. She said that if God took something from you that you never imagined losing, it's because something so much better for you that you never imagined having. It was the very next day at 5, 11 a.m., the cancer won and took my best, best friend away from me, the great Surya Yunus. We talk about mental health. We talk about... Um, suicidal thoughts, depression, clinical depression. This woman right here faced through all of that, including suicide thoughts. And I'm not ashamed to say it out loud. Um, but I had choices. Either I could let that darkness consume me completely, or I would do something about it. And I'm so glad I chose the latter. So in order to do something about it, and in order to save my marriage that was completely falling apart in 2010, um, my uh, husband and I, we at that, at that time were called to this fascinating country, a country that was foreign to us at this language, and that's the United States. And when, I, when we got here, I, this woman right here never held a job in her life because I got married in my final year of graduation, never ever had a job in her life, never held a job in her life. So for her to even face a world that's called corporate world, no way. There is no way I can even I can even do that. So imagine how much fear and I were like this at that time. But I had to because we were living in the Bay Area. It's not easy. It's expensive here. So I knew I had to get out there and put and get the right job. And it was the summer of 2010 when I got um, a call from this quite a fascinating company called Genentech. I was beyond surprised. You're inviting somebody who has no experience, nothing whatsoever. Would you want to come for, want me to come for an interview? Okay. And at that time, I think they had a campus building in Redwood City. It's no longer there now anymore, unfortunately. But um, I remember I was standing outside the building, constantly fixing my scarf, brushing my pants, and just making sure that I look I look okay. And I remember I took a couple of deep breaths, opened the door, and went inside the building. And I was greeted by this remarkable human being by the name Bob Albert, who I did know at that time was going to be my manager. And he welcomed me with a big smile and warmth and said, welcome to Genentech. And I didn't realize that was the beginning of a whole new journey. Because after that, honestly speaking, the way I grew and evolved and was surrounded by people who have lifted me up, uh, bold me enough, empowered me enough to walk away from marriage that was never meant to be saved. Uh, after that, I swear, I thought this was it. I've conquered all my fears. I have empowered myself. Yay, this is it. But little did I know that life had other plans for me. 
life always is mystery, right? And it has always other plans for you. And at this time, you all might remember this time as well. Remember 2016, when this entire country was shaken by a growing hostile political movement and rise of anti-migration. And this time, my safety and my family's safety, people like me and their safety, was getting questioned. Uh, my identity, how I appeared, was turning into shame. I was ashamed of being seen as a Muslim. I was ashamed of showing up and at work and being seen as a Muslim, even though that environment there was far from what I had imagined. The, the openness, the warmth, the welcome, the acceptance, I always felt there. But you know, there's a psychological thing in your mind, right? You start questioning yourself, your being, my identity, my, my customs, everything was just turning into shame. Um, I started standing behind folks at the train station because I was just so afraid some psychotic person or lunatic would just push me in front of it. And that's because those were the scenarios I was getting to hear across the globe. Um, and I remember it was such a heartbreaking conversation with my mother who um, wanted nothing more than the well-being of her daughters and the safety of their daughters when uh, she was honestly being very open that we do not wear what we call this, it's our headscarf. Uh, just for that we can be safe and we won't be seen as Muslims. And that was the first time that I really just paused and questioned myself, why am I ashamed of who I am? And that was the, that was the start of a whole other journey that I embarked on becoming uh, a clinical psychologist because I wanted to work with men, women, teenagers, children, uh, whether it's from our background or from our community or outside of our community, just to help them accept their fear and face that fear, not be ashamed of who, who they are and challenge the, the surrounding, the thinking of the people around them. Uh, and it's amazing, right? When you, when you help someone in that capacity, you also find questions, the answers to the questions that, I, that you're seeking, just like I was, um, around shame and fear. You know, being able to reimagine yourself beyond what other people see, it's the most difficult task of all, yet the most rewarding thing if you can. Uh, because we all come into this world in a body, people with neurological difficulties, environmented or, uh, environmental or um, more impacted communities, boys, girls, boys who want to dress up as girls, girls who wear wheels, um, uh, athletes who bend their knees in sign of protest, sexually assaulted victims, uh, black, white, Asian, Latinos, us as a community right now as Muslims, uh, Native Americans, you or me, we all want what everybody wants and that is to dream and to achieve. But sometimes the society tells us and we tell ourselves that we don't fit the mold. But the very limited time I've been in this country, and that's going to be close to now 12, ye 12 years, is that we all have one thing in common, and that's being human. So we all should be fighting towards one race, and that's the human race. And you all might be wondering, why am I telling you all of this? Number one, I never imagined myself standing before wonderful people like you, adults like you, um, and sharing this part about my life 12 years ago. And two, these 12 years, if I look back, wow, it's, it's been a long journey, but it's been worth it. And this girl who was, a, who was just lived her life in fear is now a woman who's the one beginning to embrace and face that fear. So I hope by sharing this, I get to learn a little bit about all of you. And don't just to hear my story. Listen, and try to listen to each other's stories, just like I hope I listen to yours. And our stories have no ending. They have chapters, sequels, pages upon pages, and our stories must go on. And that can only happen if we help each other write it together. So thank you for listening about myself. And with that, I would love to listen to yours. So take a couple of minutes. We'll give each other like about 15 minutes. Would that be a good time? Then I would love to hear. I would love to have volunteers. I don't want to call you on out, but if I can have volunteers who can just share a bit of their own defining moments, that would be amazing. Okay, so go ahead. We got one more minute and then I will be looking for seven remarkable, I think you all are remarkable, seven remarkable young men and seven remarkable young women who can share some of those defining moments for me.
volunteers are always welcome. And if I don't see anyone, then please don't hate me. I will, um, I might ask for myself then, who can actually share some of their defining moments. I know sometimes the mic can be a little overwhelming. You have a choice. If you guys don't want to use the mic, I'm totally fine with it, to be honest. And if you want to, the mic is right here. Okay, so I'm going to share a short story that's not nearly as impacting as yours, but um, this story takes place when I first started practicing hijab, which was at the age of, I would say, around 11. So I grew up in a community where all my friends and aunties I know are wearing the hijab. However, my family was, I would say, not as practicing as my immediate family. And so not many of my aunts wore hijab and they did not believe in it either. So my mom started wearing hijab um, in, her, in her 30s. And when I started wearing hijab, I, I guess I could say that the reaction I got from my family members was a mix of many things. They were surprised. They thought I was too young, that these are my prime years to show my hair. They thought there was no um, proof in the Quran that hijab is necessary to wear. And many times from close family members, I was told that it's best if I just take it off since they do not see it necessary. Now, I thought this was really tough because it's one thing to have friends or aunties in the community say that, but when it's family members who you really care about and they're the closest thing to you, it makes everything so much more difficult because I have to keep my respect that I have and I can't, I can't um, lash out at them even if I'm frustrated. So it took a lot of patience, but throughout this whole journey, I had my mom with me and that was really special because she had gone through all of the same things despite starting the hijab when she was in her mid thirties. And I did eventually get over it, but it took a lot of confidence and really getting comfortable with who I have decided to be. And I think when my family members realize that I'm doing everything like everyone else and still wearing hijab, it made, it made them look at it in another way. And I would go to family events or weddings where all the girl cousins are getting their hair done or dancing and doing things that I myself do not practice. Well, I do get my hair done, but not, I don't show my hair. So I was always kind of the odd one out and I learned to accept it. And when I did, it made them comfortable with who I've decided to become. Thank you. Thank you, Madia. That was just, wow. You said you were not powered. Yeah, a clap, I would say, powered. Yes, thank you. You said that was not powerful, my dear? I wish I had that much courage at your age. Amazing, mashallah, that's amazing. So since you were so brave and so bold to be the first one, how about you decide who will be the next one to actually speak up and share their journey moments? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. so um, uh, this story takes place uh, during my freshman year of high school. Uh, I joined the journalism team this year because I'm interested in that. I thought it was a good experience. So uh, I write for the school paper. And the uh, first issue we printed, um, I, got, I got front page, and my article was about uh, the, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but the calls to genocide of Muslims in mm -hmm. Haridwar in India, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I wrote an article about, on that, and it uh, got front page, and it was delivered to a bunch of classrooms. So. Uh, I walk into my English class, right, and uh, the uh, front page cover, like the picture on the front page was of Modi, right? Uh, the idea being that he's like the person who's perpetuating all this. Um, and a couple of Hindu classmates come up to me and they're, you know, they start congratulating me. I was like, yeah, that was cool, you know, like we're Indian, you know, we got that. But uh, then they start chatting BJP, BJP, right? And B, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but PJP is the party which is essentially condoning the uh, lynching, the genocide, and the uh, uh, general hate against Muslims in India, right? And they started chanting it. And I mean, 
it's just interesting because, I mean, they hadn't read the article. They didn't realize that I was even talking about uh, against the BJP, you know, and like how they were, you know, uh, oppressing Muslims in India. But um, and I also don't think that they meant any malice behind it because I honestly do not think that they understood anything about the BJP as a party or what they stand for. I think it's probably just their parents, you know, uh, support it, so they support it, right? Almost like a sports team in that way, you know, not really like a political party. Um, so I, I think that moment was interesting because it kind of shows that, you know, a lot of people don't understand politics in the way that they should. They don't give it the, uh, the weight that it should deserve, right? Uh, like I said, it, it's treated like a sports team, right? Um, you know, like you were born into a family that votes Democrat or Green or Republican or whatever, right? And you don't actually do any critical thinking. And I mean, at that point, if you're just gonna vote for a single party without actually thinking about it, you might as well just um, not be in a democracy, right? Because that's kind of the point of a democracy is that everybody has their individual opinions. So, I mean, yeah, that, that's why. I, th I thought that was an interesting experience. Thank you, Lisa. Oh, that's awesome. Kudos to you for being so brave to actually write that article. It's not easy. It's not easy at any time and age. Thank you. Ladies, do you have a volunteer? Anyone? Yes. Honey, I always forget your name, I'm sorry. So one of the big moments in my life was when I was six years old. So I was born in England. And when I was six in 2013, my whole family decided to move to America. And that was just a really difficult thing for me because my whole family, well, my dad's side is in Yemen, but my, all of my mom's side is in England. So I had to leave, we had to leave everyone. And I was six years old. I didn't really understand what was going on. Uh, I didn't realize we were like staying in America forever. And um, I don't know, when I got older, it was like, I realized how like isolating it was for me because in England, we had a big Yemeni community. We had like strong, Arab community and when we moved I didn't really have that I didn't have any other family friends no in like extended family not it was just me and my siblings and parents and um, that was uh, really tough for me because I kind of realized I'm a very quiet person I was like I think maybe that's why because I don't I don't know because I didn't have any like a big community surrounding me and I didn't and I didn't feel connected to my culture. I have no Arab friends and it was really difficult for me once I realized that. Also, when I was even in America, I moved around a lot and that was really tough because I'd make friends in a new school and then I just uh, leave right all over again, make, make new friends, leave. And then so I only really had one constant friend over the times that I've moved. Um, I don't know. It was just a very, it's a very tough thing for me. And it's like this year that I was really coming to, <coughs> I was really coming to terms with how that affected me, like moving, because it, it, it really sucked for me, especially with moving countries. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I can imagine. I can only imagine that sense of belonging, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being so brave. Gentlemen, volunteers. Okay. <clears throat> um, this was a time, I think. How many years ago? Like four or five years ago, uh -huh. maybe three. Um, I really didn't care, right? Um, so my dad, she religious, right? Um, I didn't really want to go to much. I just want to stay home, right? Uh, I didn't care. So then one day I was just walking down the street. Uh, I almost got run over. <laughs> um, 
I didn't really know why. I, the car just swerved. Uh, and then from that day on, I really, you know, thank the Lord. Just. Great, thank you. Thank you. It takes courage. It takes courage to speak about that. So thank you. Thank you for that. So we've got two boys and two women, two men, sorry, young men and women who have spoken up about their experiences. Um, peace. We've got time. We're doing good with time. So any volunteers? Yes, Aisha. So, I'm sorry. Um, I moved to the United States in 2019, and that's kind of where my life, you know, toppled over because I lived in Dubai my whole life. And, you know, Dubai is a predominantly Muslim area where, you know, it's the Middle East. So I lived there my entire life. And when I moved to the United States in 2019, sixth grade right in the middle I knew no one um and so it was kind of like coming from a predominantly Muslim area and moving to the United States where you know it's I'm like there's two Muslim girls in my entire school so that was like a big change for me and um you know getting to know people and really staying in touch with my religion that was that was quite hard for me, especially when after I moved, I you know became I luckily I met a lot of new friends and accepting friends, but there were people that were like you know the occasional oh you're Muslim and kind of like the sketchy look, and people who like were rude to me about it, and that was a new thing because I wasn't used to that coming from a predominantly Muslim area. So I think it took a lot of like courage to like actually stay with my religion and not just like l trying to, you know, leave it in order to fit in. So that's, I feel like that's like growing up, that's kind of like a big thing fitting in because when you're like the odd, like I guess the oddball, I guess, it's kind of hard because you want to, you know, relate to other people and you want to fit in with other people and you want to do things that, you know, maybe it doesn't feel right to you, but you just want to do it for the sake of fitting in. But, you know, luckily I found a really good community that I could be a part of and I, f I made a lot of good friends that accepted me for being Muslim. And yeah, that's my story. Thank you, Aisha. Beautiful. And what a coincidence. We'd only shared the name. We came from the same country, which is, yeah, Abu Dhabi right here, Shahama. That's where I'm from. Yeah, parents are from Pakistan, but that's where I grew up. Coincidence. Coincidence. Wow. This is, this is getting so unique. I love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love it. I'm loving the stories, by the way, so far. Wow. Really, I was having not, I'm going to be honest, I wasn't having a very good morning. I wasn't having a very good morning, but you all really brightened up my day. Thank you. Thank you all so much for sharing this. We do have time for a couple more folks. I just, seriously, I just feel like doing this for the rest of the session, but I know we have one more activity to do because it's so amazing hearing your stories. Yes. Awesome. Your name? I can't read from here. Sorry. Okay. Awesome. Do you like, would you prefer a mic or would you like to speak to it? Okay. That's fine too. Thank you, Madhya. Assalamu alaikum. All right, so like a few years ago, um, my family and I decided to take on some foster brothers for two weeks because their parents were traveling internationally and like for safety reasons, they weren't allowed to go. Um, and that was just an incredible experience for me and my family. Um, you know, we heard their stories, which were very sad. They were like tortured and they had to run away and caught and run away again, homelessness. But eventually they were saved and brought here. 
And um, they grew up Muslim in Burma, but um, it's hard for them to keep the religion because they, they, they're not in a Muslim family anymore with their foster parents. Um, but it's nice to still be connected with them. And, you know, my family and I likes to, like to like show our religion to them and remind them of what it's like. And we recently just spent Eid with them um, and prayed in front of them. And it's just nice to like, to remind them of that and keep that connection with them. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's amazing. There you go. Um, yeah, so the summer before I went to fifth grade, um, I spent all my summer in Texas where my mom's family lives. And um, I, so after I came back, it was about a week after, and school was gonna start in a few days. And then um, we got the news that my grandfather was in the hospital and that like he wasn't in a good condition. Um, so my mom left immediately, obviously, because it's her father. And then, you know, we're, we're just waiting, we're really nervous, like what's gonna happen, right? And we hear that he's on the ventilator, so like he's on life support. And you know, it's like he's probably gonna, like he's probably not gonna live. And it was just so scary. And like two days later, my dad's like, we gotta go, we gotta go. My dad doesn't tell us anything. He just like, probably gonna miss school. So we make it there and when, once we're at the airport, my mom tells like me and my younger brother, like, you know, he's gone, you know, like he's gone, he's gone. And my sister, she was so quiet the whole way there cause she already knew my dad already told her. And it was really hard for me, mainly just because like, you know, he was blind. So it's like, he kind of lived life not seeing the world and just gave, gave me so much thankfulness for, be, for being able to, to see, to speak, to hear. And it just kind of taught, taught me the value of life and you know how to live every moment and not to waste life. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. We have some very special people in our lives, right? They teach yeah. us so much and they leave us with so much wisdom. Thank you. Wow, you all are just, Really cool, really amazing. I just absolutely loved each and every one of your stories. Those who did not get to share it, it's okay. I'm sure it's as equally powerful than I've heard before. So thank you all to those who spoke up and shared theirs. And I hope I get to hear others as well one day. Uh, I think a round of applause for all of you guys. Really, really love it. All right, so we'll move on to our last activity and it's called the Identity Corners. So we got the opportunity to learn a little bit about each other more deeply. But now in small groups, what we're going to do is we're going to continue this process in a bigger audience. And um, around you, you guys might be seeing some themes, some stickies or post-its, whatever you want to call it, on the wall. And the idea is we're exploring these categories in a little bit more detail. And I'll speak a little bit about each category, those who want some clarity on what each category stands for. So I'll quickly just read out the description they have on this page. So race, a category that was socially and historically created based on the way people look. This category has a lot of social, political, and economic importance. Race is often tied to people's physical characteristics, example, skin, color, hair types, eye shape, eye color, etc., especially of different races, in, which include white, black, Asian, Latino, etc. Ethnicity, where is ethnicity? Right there, okay. Refers to a group of group or people of the same nationality or land of origin who share a distinct and or common culture. Example of ethnicities include Pakistani, Mexican, Egyptian, or Arab, etc. Gender, refers to the individual's biological sex and the social roles, behaviors, and characteristics associated with either males or females. Class, a social ranking or category that's based on income, financial resources, education, status, and or power. Ability, possession of the capacity, requires physical, mental, and psychological capabilities required to do something or get something done. Citizenship, right there, okay. Refers to the country in which you have documentation and legal rights as a citizen. In the U.S., having citizenship grants individuals the ability to vote, travel freely within the U.S., and access all kinds of social services. Language. Where are you, language? Right there. Okay. Language gives us access to different social spaces. Language is deeply tied to our culture, politics, and perceptions of different people. And I think this last one, religion. 
refers to an organized system of beliefs about human existence and the divine. There's a lot of diversity within religious groups too. Most people here are Muslim, but we look, if we look more closely, we'll see that there are many different ways in which people practice and express their uh, Islam. So here's what we're going to do. So hopefully that gives a context of each definition in the category. If, you, uh, if it's not clear, you can ask me again. There's no wrong question here. There's no stupid question in this room, okay? Don't ever feel that way. So what I want you all to do is, and this will require you all to get up. I'm sorry, this cannot be done while you're sitting. So can, the first part is that uh, this activity is, which category you identify with most on day-to-day -day basis? As you heard the descriptions, which category do you feel connected with most on day-to-day -day basis? And you can go ahead and stand next to it. And then we move on to the part B of the exercise. I'll give the last couple of seconds if you want to move around, but I'm assuming starting from this gentleman right here all the way to you, we are with religion? Wow, religion, lots of group. Who would like to tell me why they chose this category? Well, that was the most one that you think on day to day basis. So now it's a flip. I'm going to flip the question. Which category do you think about least on day to day basis? Okay, so just to be clear, we got language, three ladies right here, gentlemen, class, right? Gender, ability says, honey, we're starting with you all the way. No, okay, so you guys are citizens, right? Okay, honey, all the way to you. That's where the ability status is ending. Okay, awesome. Alrighty. Okay. So now, same question. Why? Why do you guys chose this category? I'll start with language. If that's okay. All right. Who would like to share their thoughts? So you know, often we think about identity categories with which we struggle the most. Like if we have to work two jobs to support our families, then our class is not something we get to ignore. And some of you also describe, you know, ways in which an aspect of your identity makes you feel prou proud and empowered. For the second question, we can see that it's easy to forget uh, about the identity categories where we represent the norm or a more powerful group in society. For example, it's easy to forget about ability, right? And if you, ha if you have no trouble walking, seeing, hearing, or thinking on a, on a daily basis, which category do you think should have been up there or should be added there that I have missed out? Is there any category you all can think of? That there's one that's coming to my mind, but yes, honey. Education. Education, okay. There's that one. What about privilege? A special benefit or advantage enjoyed by the members of a more powerful identity groups. Privi privilege is often <laughs> invisible to those who possess it. I spoke about gender. That's something I think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Privilege is something, to be honest, I do forget about. I have family back home who are not as privileged as I am. I have cousins, distant family, friends. Um, that is something, to be honest, I don't think about very often. And it's something that I should be extremely grateful about. Because I think in one way or the other, all of us have that, right? in some capacity, whatever we feel like it's the right one, but it's, it's there. So we'll be talking about this concept in more detail, by the way, in the sessions to come. Not in this one, but, and we'll be unpacking some elements of identity. So next week, when you guys will be back again, we'll be building on some of the themes we touched on today uh, with a new, of course, facilitator. As much as I would love to be with all of you, it'll be somebody new, amazing. So as we break down stereotypes, how we experience them, how to recognize them in the media, and the consequences of stereotypes in the world. So we're talking about that in the next session. And with that, as much as I would hate to say, we're almost at time, and I believe lunch is almost here, or? Okay. So I want to make sure you guys get fed. But like I said, this was such an honor, really such an honor to be with all of you for these, this, this couple of hours only. But I'm really looking forward to what you all will explore in the upcoming session. And hopefully, I'll see you all on the graduation day, which would be nice. Yeah. So thank you, everyone, so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. My name is Maimona Afsalberta. I am 
a, a special education teacher in San Jose. And I'm also on a local school board as an elected official. Um, so we're going to be talking about stereotypes. Um, and stereotypes impact Muslims in a lot of ways, right? I'm sure a lot of you have experienced them or witnessed them. Um, but they also impact a lot of other groups of individuals. And so it's important that we learn about and specifically reflect on the negative ex the ne negative impact of stereotypes, but also how we can take back some of that power um, so that we can counteract the stereotypes that do exist um, in our society and communities. So we're going to start by actually looking at some of the historical examples um, from the Sira and from the early believers. And so to do that activity, um, well, actually, let me backtrack. Did you all get a copy of the agenda? They don't have a copy? Okay, so I'll go ahead and uh, read the agenda and goals then just so you know what to expect. So this session, again, is going to cover the personal experience. It's going to cover stereotypes and the relationship between stereotypes, policies, and real-world consequences. And then some of the goals are we're going to discuss and process different interpersonal experiences with stereotypes. We're going to reflect on the ways that all of you as students, uh, Muslim students specifically, can be recipients, but also perpetuators of specific stereotypes. Um, and we're going to understand how those uh, stereotypes also perpetuate unjust policies against marginalized communities, um, and how the, that knowledge operates in a larger system of oppression. And then hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to generate kind of a thesis statement which articulates different platforms for combating oppression as individuals and as a broader community. So that's just to give you an idea of uh, what to expect uh, in the agenda. And don't worry, I'm not having you write an essay at the end of this. I'll leave that up to Brother Osman if he uh, wants to challenge you with that. I did see the thesis statement, but I don't believe that's part of a, an activity yet. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and do uh, read. Uh, I'll re go ahead and read a story. Um, but before we do that, I would like for you to check under your desk um, to see if you have a card um, stuck under your desk somewhere. So if you have a card, or under the oh, on top of your desk. Okay, perfect. If you have a not the, note. not the sticky note, but an actual card. Yes, I see a couple of you. Perfect. So if you have a, a piece of paper. Uh, with a term and a definition. When I come across that term in the story, I would like for you to um, read the, the term, the word, and its definition so that we all have um, the same understanding of what that word means. Okay, so you should all have a copy of the story, though. Do you all have that? That's what I'm going to be reading off of to start us off. Okay, and then do we have all of the cards? I think I saw a couple. There's not too many. But everyone who has a card, okay. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna ask you to read that, please. Thank you. Okay. So we'll go ahead and get started. We're gonna be reading the the elite of Quraysh and the early believers. Again, to give us some context, right? Why as Muslims is it so important? And what does the Sira teach us about this? The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, came from the tribe of Quraysh, the most powerful and prestigious tribe in the Arabian Peninsula. Their status as keepers of the Kaaba and caretakers of the pilgrims who visited the holy site every year gave Quraysh authority and legitimacy. The pilgrim Pilgrimage was also a big source of revenue for the business leaders of Quraysh, who sold souvenir idols and other goods to the pilgrims. Hence, idol worship was a source of power and money for the leaders of the Quraysh. It was no wonder that then that they felt threatened when the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, called for the worship of one God. This threatened the entire social, political, and economic power structure of the elite. It's no surprise that the early community of Muslims faced all kinds of accusations and stereotypes. 
So who has stereotypes? On the piece of paper. Can you go ahead and read us what stereotypes mean, please? Thank you for reading it, that to us. So stereotypes to delegitimize de their cause. The prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, was called a fortune teller, a poet, a liar, and a sorcerer whose words could tear families apart. The leaders of Quraysh looked upon the early Muslims with suspicions and distrust, believing that their Islam threatened the very fabric of society. Arguably, the tribal elites created the first atmosphere of Islamophobia. Who has the term Islamophobia for us? Yes, can you read that out loud for us, please? Islamophobia refers to unfounded fear of and hostility towards Islam and Muslims. Such fear and hostility leads to discrimination against Muslims, the exclusion of Muslims from mainstream, mainstream political or social contact, stereotyping, guilt by association, and racism. Thank you. So it created the first atmosphere of Islamophobia, which was used to justify the harsh treatment of early Muslims. Quraysh operated a system of tribal alliances, so if you messed with a member of the powerful clan, then you were basically asking for tribal war. Having tribal alliances with the rich and powerful meant having physical protection. Hence the people without those alliances, without that protection, the slaves, servants, and immigrants of Mecca received the worst discrimination. Who has discrimination? Yes, can you please read that for us? Okay. Thank you, brother. Unequal treatment of people based on their membership in a group to discriminate is to treat a person not on the basis of who they are, but on the basis of a prejudgment about a group. Discrimination can describe treatment under the law, like segre segregation laws, or against the law, like hate crimes. Thank you for reading that. So they received the worst discrimination when the leaders of the Quraysh decided that they would no longer tolerate the practice of Islam. Sumayya and her husband Yasser were the first martyrs in Islam. They were poor, Sumaya, a servant, and her husband Yasser, an immigrant from Yemen. Upon accepting Islam, they were tortured and eventually killed, with no tribal connections to protect them. One can argue that Sumaya and her husband Yasser were the victims of classism. Who has classism? Okay, so bring the mic over, and then if you could read the definition of classism, please. Um, any attitude, action, or institutional practice that subordinates people due to their economic condition. A person's class is determined by access to a mix of resources, including, but not limited to money, culture, contacts, and formal education. Class includes food, clothing, language, cars, entertainment, work, and much more. Thank you. Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, was a black slave from Abyssinia. His talent and integrity earned him the confidence of his slave owner, Umayyah ibn Khalaf, who entrusted Bilal to manage his trade and goods. His refined character and tremendous recitation of poetry surpassed many of Mecca's elites. But because Bilal was the son of a black woman, he would never be accepted among the leaders of the Quraysh. Upon learning that Bilal had become Muslim, Umayyah placed burning desert rocks on his flesh and subjected him to extreme torture to get him to renounce his faith. In legendary defiance, he repeated over and over again, Ahadun Ahad, Allah is one, Allah is one. Bilal's experiences illustrate the depth of society's institutionalized racism. Who has the word racism? Racism is a system of oppression used 
to the advantage of one race and the disadvantage of another race or races. It involves the use of institutional power to reiterate stereotypes and enforce dis discrimination in systemic ways. Thank you for reading that, that uh, definition of racism. You see, Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, understood that these stereotypes were a mask for the real fears of Mecca's elite. In a society that worshipped wealth, tribal connections, and whiteness, la ilaha illallah, there is no god but God, meant abandoning these false idols that gave the elite of Quraysh their power in Meccan society. Islam came as the newest and baddest form of knowledge power. Who has knowledge power? Yes. A knowledge power refers to the idea that if you can influence the knowledge that people adopt through media, education, pop culture, and other social mediums, then you can influence how power is exercised either ethically or unethically, stereotypes are a negative form of knowledge power which work to advantage certain groups and disadvantage others. Thank you for reading that definition. So Islam gave us that knowledge power in the Arabian Peninsula. It's no wonder then that many of the earliest and most dedicated believers were servants, slaves, women, and youth, supposedly the weakest people in society. So that gives us some context for our, for our lesson today, right? I want you to go ahead and turn to like a person sitting next to you, whoever's uh, closest maybe, and maybe, and let's, let's talk about this a little bit. Talk to them about in this story, how are the ideas about groups of people related to the systems that mistreat people? So I'll say that one more time. I want you to turn and talk to them about how the ideas about groups of people are related to the systems that mistreat people. So go ahead and turn and talk. I'll give you guys a couple of minutes just to process what we read. Okay. Free a brave soul and share what you processed with your partner. Um, basically what I thought that I understood from this was that the people in the tribe with the higher social hierarchy or the people with the higher status were more, were less likely to accept Islam because their idol worship was kind of, it was sort of a thing that got them to their higher status so they were less likely to give that up for Islam because then they'd lose that status. Yeah, that's a great connection, right? There was, there was so much that they were gaining financially from their social status that would be a great loss to them if they decided to go against, right? Because it's all about the connections you had. So if you're going to go against that, then it would jeopardize your position. Thank you for sharing that connection. Okay, so before we get into an acti another activity, what I want to actually do is... You might be wondering, like, okay, well, why did Brother Usman or why did Care pick me to do this session? Um, like, who am I and why, why, is this, like, why is this such a big deal to me? Well, I would argue that stereotypes actually drastically change the trajectory of my life. And I'm not saying that as an exaggeration. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my story, um, specifically with stereotypes. And really, I feel like I had a Experienced them as, you know, like a, as a student. Um, I went to an Islamic school in Sunnyvale, and so I, I, I was always around a lot of Muslim. My peers were always Muslim. Um, but when, when I became a teacher and decided to teach in the public school, um, that was some of my first experiences. So I had been teaching about um, four years at the time and as a special education teacher, and so most of my time spent on a public middle school campus working with students with learning disabilities. Um, and so at the time, again, working there for about four or five years, um, I, I honestly was doing great. It was, you know, things got tough sometimes. You know, you've all been middle schoolers, so you understand. It's, sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to work with. But I would say my life really changed on 9-11-2017 when I came to my classroom early to get set up and started. And as I turned the corner, I see that my classroom had been vandalized with words of hate, words associating me with terrorism, 
I had ISIS uh, written on my door and I just could not believe what I was seeing because the majority of the students that I work with were also students of color, students who are English language learners, uh, students who are undocumented. And so they also had lots of, you know, they also experienced stereotypes. Um, but for me, and you might remember what happened in November of 2016. Does anyone remember what happened November 2016, which was right before this? Or January of, 20, uh, of 2017? Yes. Trump got elected. Um, so that kind of started a snowball effect for me to that inst instance on 9-11-2017 where I saw that my classroom had been vandalized. So I was really devastated. Um, I was not expecting that to happen. Um, and unfortunately, that was the 13th incident that had taken place on my school campus. And not just to me, but to other um, other hijabis, other staff members who work there. Um, and so I was, I was alarmed. And I was alarmed not just for how that impacts me as a staff member, but the environment that it was cultivating for other students. So what did I do? I decided to call CARE. <laughs> I had been in their Muslim Youth Leadership Program, and so I knew a lot about uh, the types of resources that they offered. Um, and so I called CARE and I said, you know, like, what do we do? And we talked about a plan um, to figure out how I could gain back the power in that situation. Excuse me, I'm having a little job malfunction here. And so the plan that we came up with was I decided I was going to go public with my story. And so with CARE's help, I um, basically decided to demand action of the school district, right? They are responsible for creating the systems that protect students, that protect staff, that protect our community. And so my, my story was printed on the front page of the Mercury News, which is a new organization in San Jose that November and I decided to speak at a school board meeting um, in front of my local elected officials. Um, and specifically what I was asking them is what are the policies you have in place to protect us from these experiences? How are we going to respond to these experiences? Because these stereotypes are not acceptable and in this case resulted in a hate crime um, with my classroom being vandalized. So after that story went public and after I spoke at the school board meeting, that's, um, well, first of all, it was terrifying. I'm not really much of a public speaker. I enjoy being in my small classroom and speaking to and working with kids, right? Um, but speaking publicly kind of created this chain reaction where I was flooded with people contacting me. Literally, I had all of these cards and emails and phone calls of both people who were, who were horrified of what was happening in our community, but also people who were like, you're making this up. What did you do to these kids to make them do this to you? And I really didn't know what to do with it. Um, but it was a lot, right? It was a lot to process. And so I needed to figure out how to use my knowledge and my experiences about stereotypes to really impact lasting change, right, in the system. And so when a local position opened up on, my, on a school board in the district which I, where I live, I decided, why not? I'm going to run for that seat. And I won. And I became the first hijabi elected official in the state of California. And the reason that I did that was so that I could help write the policies that then lead to change and work with CARE on things like Muslim Day at the Capitol to advocate for bills like AB 2291, which was to help teachers get trained on responding to school bullying. And so, so here's that. 
that uh, article. So again, why do I share all of this with all of you? Because I know, unfortunately, each and every one of you has probably experienced a stereotype at some point in your personal experience or witnessed someone else experiencing that. Again, it's not just to Muslims. Stereotypes impact many groups of individuals. And so it's really important for us to reflect on those experiences today and think about what can we as individuals do for to help ourselves but also helps our community and our broader society to challenge these stereotypes this was just a image of the npr article where i didn't know i was going to be sworn in but i was sworn in to take that uh, position on the school board so with that i want to give you guys some a chance to process what your own experiences are so each of you should have a post-it on your table. Do you all see those? So what you're going to do is you're going to think about what are some, what is a stereotype that you have personally experienced? Um, it could be, and there's, I'm going to go through a couple of different examples of what those, um, what those can look like, because there's actually different types or different ways that you can experience stereotypes. And I'll give you a couple of those. So I'm not sure actually if I can write this down, maybe. It might just might be helpful. That way you can think about, because there's actually different types. Um, and I think it would be helpful. You might be familiar with a lot of these, right? Um, like a slur. How many of you have been called or heard someone be called a slur before? A slur is a derogatory term to, meant to demean a person or a group of people based on that stereotype about your identity. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced a slur or seen someone or heard someone be called a slur before. Yeah, so a lot of you, right? Um, so that's one like example that's kind of easy. So when I um, came to my classroom, there was quite a number of slurs kind of written uh, on my walls of my classroom. So that was one of those experiences of a specific stereotype. The other examples, um, I guess I'll just read them out loud and then if you have questions about a specific example, let me know. We have an encounter. Jarring experiences where your social reality or constraints are made real. We have microaggression. It's a brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial slights and insults towards people of color. Now, microaggressions are actually really important to understand that they are created out of an environment where racism exists. So this, I only learned this recently, but for example, a person who does not have, who already is in a position of power, they are the ones who can microaggress towards another person with less power. It doesn't always work the other way, or it doesn't work the other way around. So if you are in a position of power and you are using that position to abuse um, and to stereotype someone else, that is a microaggression. It has to do with that power. I talked about a slur, which is a derogatory term used to demean people based to stereotype on their identity, a stereotype threat. When you avoid acting a certain way because you might fulfill a stereotype about your identity. Um, some examples of this is like you don't want to be the angry Muslim in a, in a protest or um, you're concerned about being too loud. Like I know when I get on the plane sometimes, I'm, I get a little bit embarrassed or like nervous of if my dad or my, oh, actually, I'll give a better example of this, a little tangent here, but my husband and I went to visit waterfalls in South America, and he decides he's just so overtaken by the waterfalls that he starts doing the adhan, and I'm, like, freaking out because I'm, like, we are going to, like, people are going to think we're doing something, and, like, I was freaking out about it, but that's, you know, like, me, that was me, like, acting based on that, like, thinking people were going to think us of a, as a threat. Um, identity contingencies, when you think or act a certain way based on a stereotype of your identity. So things like Muslims girls should be quiet, all Muslims must become doctors or engineers or lawyers. Some of those are also cultural stereotypes, um, but you get the idea. So those are some examples for you to reflect on right now as you think about what to write on your post-it. Just so you kind of know, 
you're not going to be sharing your own stereotype out loud, but we will be exchanging them so that you'll randomly get to read someone else's stereotype. So just keep that in mind as you're writing this. Um, write something that you're comfortable sharing, even if it's not associated with you directly. It'll kind of help us give us more examples. Okay, so again, you have your post-it note. Go ahead and write an example. Um, it could be any of the categories of stereotypes that I've already shared, um, of an encounter, a microaggression, a slur, a time where you felt you had to act a certain way or avoid acting a certain way because of a stereotype about your identity. So I'll give you a couple minutes to do that on the post-it note. So we'll go ahead and, Hadra, can you start with yours, please? Um, mine says microaggressions at school. Okay. Um, it says, my friend was called a terrorist. Yeah. Um, mine says, the day a kid called me an, out an outsider and go back to your own country. Yeah, yeah you read what? It says the concept that a woman's place in the world is to stay at home and do household chores. Thank you for reading that. Um, someone calling me a terrorist as a joke in seventh grade. Um, mine says that um, people thought that I was Indian when then I, uh, when I told them that I was um, Pakistani, they labeled me as someone who's not proud enough of their ethnicity. Um, being associated with terrorism constantly just because one is Muslim. Um, they said two times I've been flipped off for being a different race or hijabi, and one the first time was when a guy was kept staring at me weirdly and making me uncomfortable, and then just flipped me off. And then the second time when we were crossing the road, another guy flipped us off, even though it was our turn to walk. Uh, mine says uh, bombing slash terrorist jokes. Um, one of my friends joined about me being a terrorist and blowing up the school. Um, mine says being careful. I think it says about praying um, in school. Um, it's not safe. You can just do your best. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Uh, mine says explosion jokes when a Muslim enters a room and pieces of media like Call of Duty that cycle out various vaguely Arab terrorist antagonists. I don't have one, so I presume there's a discrepancy between the amount of sticky notes and the kids. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your flexibility. Uh, someone told my friend Falafel, go back to your country. Yeah. He called him a Falafel. <laughs> That's an interesting one. <clears throat> uh, like, if someone finds like a rude Muslim from our community, they would like generalize that all Muslims are that way. Uh, getting called a terrorist because I was Muslim. Also, getting called a nerd because I was Indian. Uh, mine says avoiding voicing my opinions in fear of being considered loud and obnoxious to give in to the stereotype of being the quiet Muslim girl. Uh, someone yelled Allahu Akbar when we were learning about 9-11 in class. Stereotype. One example of this is often in school. I avoid talking about academics or grades a lot, so I don't fulfill that stereotype towards Asians. Mine says being called a Wahhabi. Uh, mine is was called a bomber after my class learned what 9-11 was and was called the N-word. Um, uh, their father was praying at the summit of a hike and they were afraid of what other people would think. 
this one says someone was called a suicide bomber. Mine says Muslims are terrorists. Mine says I have been called a terrorist, and even though I know nobody has actually meant it, I still don't like being called that. People singing happy birthday on 9-11. Uh, being told 9-11 should be my holiday. Um, mine says, I personally faced slurs many times, microaggressions many times, multiple encounters, times when I felt I should change how I act, times when I was... Um, I don't know how to read that. Yeah. That's okay. And much more. Thank you for sharing. So I think we would all agree, right, that experiencing stereotypes is not the best feeling. It actually really sucks. Um, but there's a lot of ways, there's a lot of, and I shouldn't say but, there's, and there's a lot of way, different ways that we experience it. Some have to do with um, our Muslim identity, our identity as Muslims, and others have to do with all other aspects of um, your identity. So when we think about um, stereotypes, it's really important to think about the many, many different realms. And we heard a lot of good examples of that, of the ways that stereotypes can impact us. Um, and, but the other important thing to understand is stereotypes, although they really suck, they also impact a lot more than just our feelings. And what do I mean by that? So when we talk about the day-to-day -day incidents, a lot of times these incidents, they just become like part of the new normal. They become normalized, right? Like, oh, this is like, yeah, this happened today. It sucks. And it's probably going to happen at some point in the future. Um, but what happens is when it becomes part of our daily lives as Muslims for black people, for immigrants, for women, when they become part of this idea that it's no big deal, that's when the problem of stereotypes impacts a person's sense of belonging in society and also starts to impact the policies and the system that are being made by the decision makers. And I would say especially when the people who are sitting at the table making these decisions are not reflective of the people who are experiencing these types of things. So what I would like for us to do now is we're actually gonna do um, a little bit of deeper thinking on what we call, I know someone had the definition, but the knowledge power. Um, yes. I think we should be able to. I got some. Okay. Oops. Let's see this one. Okay. okay. So we got this one a lot. I actually heard this example quite a bit, but Muslims are terrorists, right? That's a, a pretty common stereotype. So we're going to use this tool. We've got our knowledge, policies, and then real-world consequences. So this knowledge, right, this concept that Muslims are terrorists, people are getting that from a variety of different places. Yes. So again, if, if you need to take care of yourself for whatever reason, you all are young uh, independent individuals, please feel free to take care of yourself yourself and your needs. Um, so again, knowledge. We're getting that from lots of different places. Um, this tool is going to help us understand how oppression operates on different levels. So the first level of oppression is knowledge. And knowledge is that information that individuals are getting um, and how they're perpetuated. So stereotypes are perpetuated by mass media, by culture, by education. Um, and other platforms. And it's the way that people understand the world and that impacts then the decision makers, the people who are making the policies, which then also leads to how those policies have consequences in people's real lives. Um, so we'll start with this example. 
Muslims are terrorists. I want you to give some examples of some policies, right? Um, some policies that have, that also, um, that impact people's day-to-day -day lives as a result of this, right? How many of you, I know just recently, I'll go on a little tangent, yes. The travel ban, yeah, that's a great example. So what you'll do is you're gonna turn and talk about some of those policies with your partner sitting next to you, talk about some of the policies, um, and we'll go ahead and we'll write them up. So I wanna give you, hopefully you'll be, you'll be prepared where if you don't know something, maybe you can share it with your partner and then we'll generate a list of ideas together. Okay, so again, that's a, an example of an actual policy um, that's impacted by this Muslims are terrorists. Okay, so go ahead and go and turn and talk and then I'm gonna collect some ideas from you on policies that influence And come back together, and then I know we, Brother Sman's going to bring the microphone around for you um, to share what the policy is that you guys discussed. Okay? So, who's ready? I know one of them we had was the travel ban. So, I'll start with that one. That's a policy. Okay, who has another example of a policy, either shared by you or your partner? Yes, we'll wait for the mic so anyone on the recording can hear also. Thank you. Um, stricter immigration policies or just the making the policy of becoming a citizenship much harder. Okay, you, the first part was strict immigration laws, okay. And maybe I would also add, right, that they're not always the most um, equitable immigration laws, right? Thank you for sharing that. Yes. Uh, does it have to be in America only? No. Um, well, I'm not sure if this is true, but I heard in India they're now trying to ban the hijab. Yeah. On hijab, and I would say, right, a lot of other... Um, like the burkini in France too. There's lots of like controlling of what Muslim women specifically wear. Yes, we have another one. Thank you for sharing. Uh, like the TSA and like searching Muslims over and over again, and keeping them in a security levels in the airport, etc. Yeah. Let's say TSA searches. Yeah, that the extra special treatment, right, as you go through the airport. Other examples of policies or ways that um, we have actual legislation or, or laws or systems in place based on this concept or this knowledge. You could even think broader too, like in terms of in the world, um, what are things that our laws or other policies. So I'll give you some other examples. How many of you have heard of Guantanamo Bay? Yeah, so policies where people are unjustly and without a fair or due process taken and detained for years of their life, right? That is an example. Other examples. This might, well, this might have been a little bit before your time, or maybe you've heard of it, but the war on terror, right? This concept that we can go and invade other countries just because we feel like they're more of a threat than others. Okay. Um, and then also, similarly, right, with, with immigration, I would also say things like the actual process to become a citizen, oftentimes that can be delayed or unjustly uh, ruled on based on uh, this, this concept, right? 
So this is just to give you an idea of what are ways that this actually has an impact, right? It may seem like, okay, yeah, that was in Call of Duty, you know, where they're associating Muslims with terrorism by incorporating like this violence with actual Arabic terms or words that sound similar to Arabic. But these actually have impacts on the types of policies and systems that are created. And then unfortunately, what's even worse is that these policies then have real world consequences. So that's what I want us to think about also. Go ahead and turn and talk really quickly about what are some real consequences of all of these policies or other things that you think of, of when this knowledge is perpetuated. Remember we were talking about it becomes normalized, it becomes part of our day to day. What are the real world consequences of that? I'm, I might have accidentally mentioned some of them too, but what are some real world consequences of these policies? Go ahead and turn and talk. Um, so I do remember there was this time a while back, a uh, hijabi a Muslim woman tried to go on a trip that she paid for um, in a plane, but they tried to make her take off her hijab in public and she refused to, so they didn't let her go on the trip that she paid for. Yeah, so actual innocent Muslims, right? Everyday Muslims who are being detained, Thank you for sharing. Yes. Um, refugees trapped in war zones because of like the travel ban. Yeah. Um, I had an example of somebody I know who um, their first and last name were just happened to be on like a suspect list after 9-11. Um, and as you guys know, like Muslim names tend to be common. Um, so she wasn't allowed to travel and she had a lot of restrictions just because of this, even though she never did a single thing um, and there was like nothing on her criminal records at all. Yeah, so being restricted, right? Having your basic rights, that's the impact, the real world consequence. Oops. Other examples? Oh, yes. Um, so like the war on terror invasions in Iraq and Afghanistan, a lot of innocent civilians died and it was mainly because it was a Muslim majority country. Yeah, that's a huge one, right? This actually impacts people's lives, like literally, as in people are being killed. That's an actual real world consequence, yeah. Um, I said that generally, as like a society when these things happen, like for example, a ban on hijab or TSA searches, when people see these, it gets ingrained in their brains, you know, naturally that, oh, these things are bad or like a hijab would be bad or like Muslim people are more suspicious, that kind of stuff. Yes, you bring up such a great point, is that these consequences now start to impact again, it's a cycle it's now perpetuating that Muslims are terrorists, right? It's getting so ingrained that people are, it, it's, it's a constant cycle. Yes, thank you for sharing that. Um, when something happens in like a, uh, to like a Muslim group, uh, a lot of the time it's seen as less important than it's happened to a non-Muslim group. So for example, like in Ukraine, like it's completely terrible what's happening there. But when the same stuff was happening in Yemen or Syria, uh, it didn't receive nearly as much attention uh, because it wasn't like a Western ally. And also like what's happening in Palestine where um, the Palestinian people and the governments are painted as terrorists uh, because they're trying to, you know, for the most part, defend themselves uh, from the occupying powers of Israel. So like generally like the stereotype will make most, like, you know, Mohammed said, Muslim causes less, uh, uh, less serious in the media's eye. Yeah, and I would argue that that's actually very deeply dehumanizing. When you are taking away the value of individuals' life on the basis that they're Muslim or on other basis, right? It's dehumanizing them. It's, it's stripping them of not only their rights, but of their right to exist, right? Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so again, I want you to think about 
when this also starts to impact this, are there other things that sometimes, like, again, make this worse? Like, when is this reinforced in a way amongst Muslims, for instance, or individuals who may call themselves Muslims but have different actions? What else helps, unfortunately, helps perpetuate this? Yes. Yeah, unfortunately, that is a real world consequence, right? Is when so called Muslims who, who claim Islam is the reason why they're doing this, groups like ISIS, right? That's a real world consequence, unfortunately. And they're also helping perpetuate this again, right? So they, it's the creation of these groups. So hopefully that makes sense, kind of how we have, we're so ingrained in the society where, where this is perpetuated in so many ways. And then it creates these policies that help, that continue to, are again, are building on this knowledge, but now it's actually like in laws and in systems, which then has actual consequences on individuals' lives, and it just keeps repeating. So what we're going to do is... Um, if, well, let's think about this. Let me ask one more question. How does knowing this affect the way that we address the oppression? Like, how does knowing that there's policies, that this is, yes, we're, we're living in a day-to-day -day life where this knowledge is perpetuated, but then it's created in policies and then has real-world consequences. How do we know how does knowing this affect the way that we address oppression? Any thoughts on that? Do we need more processing time? Okay, turn and talk to your partner because then I'm going to ask or I might have to call on someone. Turn and talk. I'll say the question again. How does knowing how this affects people, what does that tell us about the way that we address oppression? What are we learning from this? What do we need to do now as a result of this? And turn and talk. All right, hopefully you've got an idea of how this affects the way that we start to address this oppression. Who wants to share? Yes. Wait for the mic on this side. So one would be to stop those policies from being implemented by being active at wherever those they're being legislated. And then also to maybe spread and enforce positive knowledge to kind of create this counter effect of, oh, they're good people. And yeah, kind of, you bring so up two really important points, right? Being a part of this, right, the decision-making process when these policies are formed, and also this concept of dawah, right? We have to be able to share the positive aspects of our faith and help counteract this knowledge that's being perpetuated. Thank you for sharing that. Other examples of how do we stop this system of oppression? Yes.
Um, I said that we should always try to represent Islam in a in a good light, and so that the people around us that are maybe you know that maybe are reviewing these policies that was at like as what Islam actually is, they think that it's you know like Muslims are terrorists. We should you know try to kind of like that counteract that by representing Islam in a good light and always being like at our best behavior when we're trying to represent our religion. Yeah, it's so important to embody that knowledge, right? Again, helping make sure there's that the correct knowledge about there and the best way for people to experience that. I mean, that's how in your day-to-day -day life, you're learning, you're representing that in a lot of ways uh, by sharing that knowledge and sharing that. Thank you. Yes. We have Brother Asman bringing the mic real quick. Thank you for your patience. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, because we see it's such a clear cycle, it's essential to not um, have Muslim people um, like reacting in a way that's like fueling it more. Um, and just, just like something that came to my mind was when um, something like very crude had been drawn about the Prophet I think it was um, kind of recently, and then a man reacted with violence in it. You know, the attention was on the man who reacted, not the actual action done itself that was very wrong and offensive to, you know, us Muslims. So, yeah. Right. So much of the, the real world consequence of our actions that we also have to be mindful of. Thank you for sharing that. So again, we have to be able to counteract that oppression at all levels. That's how we break this cycle, is making sure that we are, yes, have the knowledge to be able to respond, even when it seems like something small, like a microaggression, right? And then yes, certainly at the larger level with our policies and systems, and then also speaking up and making the connection and helping other people make the connections when it's having real impacts, um, real world consequences on people's lives. Um, so again, we'll think about, and we'll think about this one a little bit more, um, maybe a little bit later on. But what we're going to do now is, remember I said we're, we're learning about this as Muslims, right? Because that's one thing that all of us have in common. But I also want you to think about we're gonna be thinking about how this now impacts other groups. We had a couple of examples when we did the, the posted activity, but you're actually gonna get a chance now to do a deep dive with on a specific other group of individuals and the way that they experience stereotypes. So you'll have your own chart of the knowledge, again, what the knowledge about a specific group that's being perpetuated. What are the policies that exist in our in our society that impact that are impacted by that stereotype, and then what are the, the real-world consequences that that group, uh, again, is experiencing as a result of this cycle. So what we'll go ahead and do is you'll each, we'll have about five groups, um, and we'll look at the dominant narratives for each of those. Your group will have, um, your group will um, each be focusing on one of those dominant narratives, right, the knowledge that's being perpetuated. So we'll have a couple of um, examples. I'll actually go ahead and read these out loud. So we have the dominant narratives are black men are thugs, immigrants are stealing our jobs, poor people are lazy, women are overly emotional and irrational, Asians are model minority. So I'm gonna give you guys about, we'll get, do 10 minutes to start in your groups, and then based on that, you're actually gonna be sharing with the larger group what you come up with in your chart, okay? Um, and you'll need someone to kind of, unless you wanna do it, tag team it, but you need someone who's gonna be sharing that information uh, as you guys uh, brainstorm on your pieces of paper. So we'll do groups, we'll do five groups. So I guess if there's like, yeah, okay. Okay, six, yes. Okay, so we can do numbers. I know you guys are probably gonna be like, no. <laughs> but six groups, right? Six groups or five? Five groups. Five groups, okay. Okay, 
So I'm going to number you off so that you get a chance to interact with some different people. Okay. So just remember your number. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two. Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Fatima McCowie. I am so, so, so thrilled to be here. Um, I have to say, out of all the things that I could be doing today, I'm super, super excited to be here with you guys. Um, it's one of my favorite things to do is this uh, program, and so I just want to say thank you for spending your Sunday morning with me. Happy Father's Day to all of your dads. Um, and if it's okay, can we just, I'd love to know who's in the room. Maybe we'll do a quick kind of roll call if everybody could just, we'll start over here and kind of go through everyone's names. Sweet. So maybe introduce yourself and a fun fact about you. Um, hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Hadra Hassan. And a fun fact about me. Um, is the mic on? Yeah. Okay. Just put it close to your, so in case the student's on the. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry there you go. That. Um, a fun fact about me is that, um, I really know, well, I enjoy reading, so. Okay. What book are you reading right now? I'm not currently reading any books, but. But you enjoy it? Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Sweet. Nice to meet you. Um, assalamu alaikum. My name is, uh, my name is Sara, but my name tag says Nuha. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, a fun fact about me is um, I used to have a pet chicken that I named after my mom. Oh, I love that. Nice to meet you. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Madiha, and I like um, decorating cakes in my free time, and I'm a Lord of the Rings fan. Great. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Zara. Um, a fun fact about me is I love baking. Really? Right. We have some bakers in here. Love it. Nice to meet you. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Aisha, and a fun fact about me is that um, I like sushi. <laughs> so do I. Great um, choice. My name is Zara, and a fun fact about me is that I like painting. Oh, I love that. <laughs> nice to meet you. Welcome. My name is Halima, and one fun fact about me is I love cats. Oh, nice. So do I. Welcome. My name is Rabia, and I like baking. Sorry, Rabia, a little bit louder. What's your fun fact? I like baking. Baking? Okay, great. Um, my name is Jenna, and I love playing basketball in my free time. You love what? Basketball. Oh, basketball. Very cool. Nice to meet you. Um, hi, my name is Samara, and my fun fact is that um, I was born in Canada. Oh, very cool. That's awesome. <laughs> my name is Musa, and a fun fact about me is I enjoy painting. I enjoy painting. You're what? I enjoy painting. Oh, nice. Okay, my name is Hassan, and I like martial arts. Nice. Assalamualaikum, uh, my name is Muhammad, and I like biking. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum, my name is Ais, and I like to go on runs in my free time. Nice. I love all these activities. Are you still thinking about yours? <laughs> math. <laughs> well, what's your Cass. name? <laughs> Cass. I said math. Coward? Okay. <laughs> Wait, what's your name? Hamza Ali. Okay, there you go. <laughs> nice to meet you. Assalamu <laughs> um, alaikum. My name is Yusuf Perwez. Uh, and my brother operated a flamethrower once. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know where he did it, but it makes me really proud. So that's my fun. Uh, that's a great fun fact. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Zayn, and I like playing soccer. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Rayan, and I like playing basketball. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Jabir, and I like playing soccer. Nice. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Safwan, and I like playing football. Cool. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Yahya, and I like playing volleyball. 
So I'm Michael, my name is Harun, and I don't play sports. So I'm Michael, my name is Mohammed, and uh, I play soccer. Nice. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. It's always so good to see kind of who's in the room and what you guys like to do outside of, outside of these walls. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. My name is Fatima, um, as, as I mentioned. Um, my fun fact is that um, I was born in Belgium, so I guess that's fun because a lot of people don't know that about me. Um, but I've been a part of CARES, gosh, I was 17 years old, so it's been 16 years. It's one of my absolute favorite organizations. Um, I started at, with MYLP, um, if you guys have heard of that program, which is incredible, highly recommend it. Um, and I'm super, super excited to be um, here with you guys. I'm originally from um, the Midwest, moved out here, went to Berkeley, and now um, I work in the Silicon Valley. So very much into tech, but love all things arts, spoken word, um, and anything that's involving community. Um, and just getting a chance to talk to the youth. I feel like this is where the future is. So thank you for inspiring us. And I'm so excited for today's session because it's a very, 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 very important topic. It's something that's super near and dear. Um, to our hearts, navigating privilege. And we have a really, really cool exercise um, and series of kind of discussion items. Um, so I'm glad you guys kind of got comfortable with the mic and you know got to start speaking because I definitely want to hear your voices. I want this to be super collaborative. This is not meant to be a lecture. I want to learn from you just as much as you guys learn from us. Um, so please don't be shy and you know pass the mic as much as we can. Um, and in that spirit, there are some housekeeping rules. Um, I know you guys have gone through this, but just as a reminder, let's respect everybody. Let's make sure that the space is safe for everyone. Um, let's keep an open mind, right? We all come ver from various backgrounds, um, various thoughts and beliefs. We want to make sure everyone feels heard um, and feels seen. And of course, kindness, positivity, curiosity, attentiveness, um, empathy, no judgment zones, right? Big, big, big on that, especially when we're talking about something as heavy as privilege, right? Something that's, that's incredibly dense to unpack. And then um, last but not least, please speak up. So again, this is meant for you guys. Uh, this is your time. And I want to make sure it's just as much uh, value to you all. So give me live feedback. If something doesn't resonate, we can move on. And we can double click on anything that you guys want to kind of uh, unpack further. But I'm super, super excited. Um, we're going to start with our very first activity. But before that, any questions, comments, suggestions, anything you guys want to add to the, uh, to the next two hours together? So it's a 10 out of 10. Great. <laughs> awesome. All right, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so as I mentioned, today is all about navigating privilege. And the main objective is for us to examine how various systems of domination um, and asymmetries of power play out in our daily lives. We want to understand how we may be on a victim of a system of oppression, but also while at the same time inadvertently perpetuate or benefit from other systems of domination in our life. I know that's a lot. We're going to talk about what that means. Um, but before that, the second main one is to understand privilege and practice acknowledging it. So. We want to identify privileges that we possess or don't possess, and then note the invisibility of those privileges through various exercises. And so our very first one is going to be an activity where we're going to count groups of five. So I'll start with my brother here. So just say one, and we'll kind of go through. Um, so one, two, and then we'll break up, and then we'll give you guys kind of some supplies. And then I'll explain what we're going to do with those supplies. So you guys ready? Awesome. We're going to go straight. Oh, sorry. Who said sex? You said sex? We start back at one. There's no sex. You did it right. Yeah, yeah. So you're one? Great. And you're two? Three? Oh, my God, that never happens. We're even. All right. Osman, do you want to tell everybody where the groups are going to lay out? Yes. So let's kind of break out into different areas. So we can have one, group one up here, and then group two, I guess, in the back here, and then group three in the middle, 
back here, and then four on the corner there, and five up in front. We can all remember that. Sweet. All right, so as you guys get to your activity groups, sorry, let me get the mic a little bit closer so folks on the line can hear. You will all be given some supplies, and these supplies are to make a tower. You can make a tower however you'd like. It can look like whatever you want it to be, but we're going to co-create a tower, and we will spend, we'll do, we'll give you guys like 10 minutes, and, um, you know, Osman, myself, and I, and some of the other facilitators will be helping um, just make sure your tower looks good. And ready, set, go. All right, if you were in group one that was sitting right here, please stand up. Group one. All right, group one, what supplies did you guys have? And anybody can answer. Just uh, raise your hand so that we know who we're to send the mic to. Uh, we had um, frosting and a plate, a Ziploc bag with the noodles, and a plastic spoon. Am I missing anything? No? Okay. And your spaghettis were cooked, no? They were cooked, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and someone else in the group. Um, yeah, thank you, Osman, for cooking those. The cop cooked them. Um, Someone else explain to me, what, it, what was it like to be tasked with building a tower with cooked noodles? And were they melted marshmallows? They were melted marshmallows. Frosting. Frosting. Oh, even better. <laughs> they can't even stick. <laughs> um, it kind of forced us to be creative and like try to figure out what works to stay, stay upright and then Obviously, dealing with losing resources was the bigger problem, more yeah. so than like figuring out we would stand up. Did any of it feel unfair? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I think um, as we lost <laughs> tools, it, it was definitely unfair. I think we, yeah. we, we, we felt pretty confident at the beginning, but then just losing tools definitely undermined confidence. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment before we move on to the group two? Thank you, group one. You guys can sit down. Thank you for sharing. Group two, if you can stand up. And group two, what supplies did you guys have? Do you want to talk in the mic? Uh, we had the same thing as group one, the cooked spaghetti, frosting, plate, and a spoon. OK. And how was it building a tower with those supplies? Uh, it was pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else in the group want to share kind of what it felt like to to build a tower? <laughs> it felt like I was trying to build a tower out of mush. Mm. Did that feel fair? No. Yeah. Did you know what the other groups had? Could you see? Yeah, that probably felt worse, huh? <laughs> it is what it is, yeah. Group three, three, stand up, please. Group three, what supplies did you guys have? Was it the same thing? We had marshmallows and a dream. <laughs> <laughs> did you say a dream? I love that, okay. How did, how did it feel to have a dream and marshmallows? Not as well as you'd think. <laughs> okay. Um, and someone else in the group, did any of that feel kind of fair? What did, you, what did it feel like at the beginning, maybe towards the end? Did you guys take a sneak peek into what other groups had? I 
If you don't volunteer yourself, I will. <laughs> yes. What was the question? Um, what did it feel like? Did you feel like it was unfair? Could you tell what other people had? Um, it was unfair, and we saw the huge tower. <laughs> so it was really From unfair. From group five? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. And then I believe we're group four. Group four, stand up. Did you guys have the same supplies as group three? Yeah? Okay. How did that feel? Go ahead. Um, not fair at all. Yeah. Were there any moments where some of the actors in the room kind of played a role or didn't? Uh, yeah, sort of. Yeah? Who played a role? Um, did someone say something about what you can and can't do? Yeah, but like, can someone else speak about it? Can someone what? <laughs> someone else speak oh, about sure. it. Oh, <laughs> sure. Sure. <laughs> We have one up here. <laughs> um, we definitely got a lot of comments saying that our structure wasn't good enough and it was sad compared to the other structures when we didn't have enough materials. Yeah. And then what did that feel like? It was bad. Yeah. Didn't like it, yeah. That doesn't feel good. Yeah, because we worked pretty hard and then it yeah. was a little too Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great assessment. Last but not least, group five. What did you guys have? Um, so we had spaghetti, marshmallows, um, a whole box of cutlery. Um, we got more marshmallows as time went on, more spaghetti, words of encouragement. Um, we also got to hold our structure because it was falling apart. Um, despite having all those materials, we weren't very good at utilizing them. Hmm. And it looks like you had a whole box. Right, we had multiple boxes and tin foil. Yeah. Lots of and things. I heard someone secretly gave you more supplies. Yeah, he was actually collecting supplies and giving them to yeah. us. <laughs> and what kind of words of affirmation did you get? Um, uh, ours is the best. <laughs> and we had to win. Yeah. Yeah. Did, what did that feel like? Did you notice anybody else had stuff? Well, we noticed that other people had less stuff. At first, we didn't notice. And then one of my group mates mentioned that they had cooked spaghetti over there mm. and something that looked like frosting. Yeah. It, it felt kind of bad, actually, because they were doing better than us. Yeah. But you kept going. Yes. So, yeah, because someone was telling you keep producing, right? Yes. Yeah. We had lots of words of affirmation. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. All right. Anybody else, Group 5? I would love to hear another voice. Yeah, we got one right here. Sorry, who raised their hand? Um, I think all in all, you know, we had, like, everything given to us, so... Uh -huh. We had like a really bad work ethic. So the fact that we had like so many resources but still like didn't make the best use of it, I think that was because like everything was given to us so we didn't really have to work as hard. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. You guys can sit down. So yeah, I you guys like crushed it. That's exactly right. I mean that's exactly the kind of experience right different groups you know live every single day we actually had three different roles that were invisibly playing different um, aspects of society so did anybody get something taken away from them or like told that like oh sorry you no longer have access to this XYZ for example I know group one had cooked spaghetti which is already hard to work with you guys made an incredible infrastructure built on this hope for like, hey, we're going to try our best. And then what happened? The cop came and took away your permit that you didn't even know about and slashed half of it, which wasn't really half. It was three-fourths. And then you had to start all over, right? Versus group five, 
there was the capitalist. There was the person that was kind of just like, let's go, let's go. Hey, wh why is that person not working? Like, let's put them to work. Hey, I secretly got you this. And then you had the entire infrastructure, the entire system working for you. And as you mentioned, right, um, you kind of worked a little less, right? You were like, oh, well, I have this privilege. Maybe I could slant it a little bit more. Maybe I could hold it. Maybe it's not a big idea or a big deal to kind of sit there on top of a, a box, right, which was like where all of the supply, everyone's supplies was being carried in. And then you had the comments, right? Like you, exactly right. Like there were people who were supposed to be the structure of capitalism saying, that's not good enough. Like why isn't it as good as that? And you're just like, because I don't have the same access and the same privilege, right? The same, the same stuff. And I'm trying so hard. And every time I try, someone tells me to work harder. And I feel like I'm just running myself out, right? Is that what that felt like? And that doesn't feel good. Is it motivating? What did that make you want to do? Just give up, right? And then at the same time, people are like, have everything or being like, you're doing a great job, like amazing. And then there were the folks in the middle who had a little bit of each, right? And they got some favoritism, but they'd got the sense of false hope, right? And I think you, one of, one of you guys said it, right? You were like, oh, we, it's the guy that said I had a marshmallows in a dream, right? Literally, we tried to create that American dream built into that. And I just think that this conversation and this workshop and this exercise is so, so meaningful. It's actually, um, it's called the Tower of Power. And it was borrowed from a partnership program between Care LA and the Japanese American allies in the LA area. Um, and it really is meant to kind of put people through the motions. And, you know, the truth is, it's like, it's hard to do these activities because I know Asman, I mean, poor guy, he was like, this is so uncomfortable, you know, to act as the person that's taking. Um, but it really, it really signifies how you could be both a beneficiary of privilege, but also be a victim all at the same time, right? Especially as, um, as many of us, um, you know, in terms of like where we come from and our families and whatnot. So I want to kind of go through some of these key principles with you all, but thank you so much for kind of the vulnerability and allowing yourself to go through these motions. I know they're not necessarily comfortable. And for some, maybe they, even like you mentioned it, even the amount of access you had and privilege was uncomfortable because you were like, but everybody else doesn't have this, but you kept going, right? Because the system was like, no, you have to win. You have to go. You have to go. So even folks who are on the other side, right, could definitely feel that and that's uncomfortable. So I, I just think that we're constantly living this battle of where do we fit and then how do we ensure that we're, you know, building a life of equity, right? Um, so any questions so far? Does that kind of make sense? Did you feel like halfway through you kind of knew why we were doing this? I felt like you guys were super smart. You caught on pretty quickly. But any questions? Does this resonate? Yeah. Um, so, like, I kind of came here late. So <laughs> I don't know if I missed this, but... And what group were you in? I was in group one. Okay. Should have been group five, but... <laughs> um, my question is like, why why does it matter as much? Because you know, like I don't mean to be like a sheikh or an imam or anything like that, but aren't we all gonna like you know die or something like that? We're all getting tested. Mm -hmm. So why does it matter if someone is tested with poverty and someone is like tested with like wealth? Yeah. Because in the end of the day, you're just gonna die. It just depends on what you use that wealth for. I think you answered your question. That's exactly uh, it. Then, it's yeah. what you use your wealth for. How do you lend privilege? How do you lend access? How do you create more access? Um, there are people who can have access and privilege and then keep it all to themselves, right? Or you can open up one door, which open up 10, and then that's how generational wealth and generational access and privilege gets created and formed, right? You, it, I think it's incredible how, it's, first of all, that's an amazing question, mm -hmm. and I, it's ex extremely relevant, right? Um, because we, what you're basically talking about is permanence, right? This idea of like, we don't live forever. Like, none of this comes with us. What's the point? But then 
you literally said, except to use it for good, right? And that's the, I think that's the point. Now, a lot of what we talked about today was visible. You can see it, you can feel it, it's obvious. If I have a million dollars in the bank account, it's obvious that I have a million dollars more than a lot of people, right? I'm, I'm sorry, brother, what was your name? Yasin, right? If I have a million dollars, I can see it. I know that I have a million dollars more than a lot, of pe a lot of other people, right? But what about things like skin tone, right? Like being racially ambiguous might get me into spaces that other people may not get into, or um, where you know my heritage comes from, or so many things that are more, um, I would say, nuanced or invisible. If I don't do the self-work to recognize the privilege that I have, then I become personally just as bad as someone who has it and can see it and doesn't give it, right? Or doesn't lend it. And I think that this is why we do this work because it's not just about what you can see, but what you can't see, right? So I'm Algerian um, and I have a lot of privilege just living in America. And yes, my family might have X, Y, Z, and you know maybe there's this that my white coworkers don't have to deal with or have a certain level of wealth that I didn't come with from, you know what I mean? But I also literally have access to jobs and opportunities that many of my cousins do not. So that's a privilege that I could sit in my shell and be like, well, you know, like I'm, I'm the victim here. And so there's different levels here. And so the more and more we see and really look at our, what we have in our lives, the more we can go, okay, I may not have access to all of these things that like white America has, but I have X, Y, Z that if we together, and I loved how groups one and two started working together and <laughs> you guys called it a union, right? Like you're like, we both don't have these supplies, but you had supplies and maybe group zero that was non-existent had no supplies and was told to build a tower. Is that, do, do you guys not know communities who are told to build something out of nothing? Yes, right? And so like, there's so many different layers to it. So yes, and that's such a good question. Thank you for asking. And we're going to go through some of that, too, about what some of those invisible privileges can look like. Um, anybody, would anybody else kind of uh, answer that differently? Or anybody else have, like, a kind of different experience about what's the point, right, of acknowledging it? Resonates? Sweet. Awesome. All right. So we did our debrief. I specifically wanted to kind of get to the how does this activity mirror society, right, which we had some dialogue about. I'd love to talk about competition. I waited until the end to say that it was a competition. Is that fair? No. Because you probably were building a tower at leisure. You probably didn't even think that your tower had anything to do with anyone else's tower, right? And then I waited at the end when I knew that group five had built the top, right? And I was supposed to play the role of a capitalist society or, or essentially kind of fueling the privileged groups that had a lot of access. And Usman was, you know, the one taking away the resources. So it was. Yeah. It was super unfair. Who's the one that's talking? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to talk on the mic? <laughs> sure. Because uh, I was taking pictures, right? Yeah. So I was going around and observing the different groups. So yeah, I didn't notice that, like, when they, I was like, how did you guys, you know, build so quickly? Because I was looking at the progress yeah. of every group and observing and just kind of seeing. And I was like, oh, some of them, like, why do they have spaghetti? Yeah. And why don't they have, like, the spaghetti that's, by the way, like, cooked, or, and the other ones just had, like, raw spaghetti. So that's like, yeah, it's unfair, right? Yeah. And if you have, if you don't have an adequate amount of resources, um, how are you going to build that? You know, right. how are you going to get that result? So, yeah. Yeah. I also thought it was really powerful to kind of see that there were four groups that didn't have as many supplies as one group. And you, you know, when I said, oh, you know, let's go ahead and take a tour around the neighborhood, all of the groups kind of marched towards group one. And you guys were like, so many of you. And then there was group one, right? And yet no one could do anything, which I think is really powerful because, I mean, I think so much of society is that. There are so many people who are marginalized um, and have lower access than those that do. 
But yes, the competition part was intentional. We wanted to make sure it was unfair. We wanted to make sure that access to information was delayed, right? I told group one at the beginning that you guys have to win. So they knew it was a competition before everybody else did, which is not fair, right? Access to information. And then we went around and started criticizing other people's towers, almost like they didn't do enough and they weren't good enough, right? Again, not fair, right? Especially when you're in competition. And for some people, it's competition over livelihood, their literal ability to feed their families. All right, so does somebody want to read this definition? Privilege. This is unearned access to social rewards, access to resources, benefits, and the power to shape the norms and values of society, which certain people receive unconsciously or consciously by virtue of their identity. For example, male privilege or white privilege. Yep. Any questions on that definition? Do you guys know what the mi model minority myth is? Has anyone heard of that before? Can we get another volunteer to read this definition? This refers to a minority group, whether ethnic, race, racial, or religious, whose members are most often perceived to achieve a higher degree of success than the population average, measured in income, education, and related factors such as crime rates and family stability. The model minority stereotype is considered detrimental to relevant minority communities because it is used to justify the exclusion of minorities and the distribution of assistance programs, public and private, to understate or slight the achievements of individuals within that minority and to misrepresent the diversity and inequity within that community. Furthermore, the idea of the model minority pits minority groups against each other by implying that non-model groups are at fault for, sh for falling short of the model minority level of achievement and assimilation. So that was big in our exercise, right? So when you had comments about the different groups, well, why can't yours look like that? What, what was happening? It was the pitting of two groups together that didn't have access or had a level of inequity against each other to make it look like, well, what, why are, have you guys not figured this out yet, right? This is extremely, extremely important. And I think a lot of times um, goes over a lot of people's head because it's extremely difficult to understand something unless you've experienced it. And I think this is why this workshop, while I imagine that many of us have had an experience with privilege, either being the victim or a perpetuator of it, right, of some levels, this workshop really helps to kind of illustrate you know, at an innocuous level as it relates to building a tower with marshmallows and spaghetti, what, how even something like that can feel so bad, right? Now imagine it being your career, your future, your education, right? So questions like, um, do you have a quiet place to study for your SATs? That may not be the reality of everybody's, right? Or, you know, is English your first language? What school district do you go to? What access to quality education, tutoring, money, et cetera, et cetera, right? These are all ways in which kind of more relatable to your levels can show up in classrooms. Um, and the model minority, definitely we see it in, in schools as well where, you know, people are pitted against each other. And a lot of ways, you know, the, the system is set up that way too. There's a lot of benefits to, I think, capitalism in that sense, but um, has anybody had an experience of this that you're like, oh my gosh, this, this makes sense, this definition, like, you know when you're experiencing something but someone puts words into it, kind of makes more sense? Do you want to share an experience that either through this exercise or maybe um, in real life? Here we have one more definition. Great. All right. Can I get one more volunteer? Okay, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that word. <laughs> okay, disaggregation. 
This is a process which involves looking at and breaking down the individual segments of the larger community that is breaking Muslim community into different ethnic or racial groups and different classes and gives a much clearer picture of the unique experiences of groups within a broader community. Great. And then before we move on to our last um, exercise here, how do we address unfair access to resources? So if we could redo this entire workshop, what would you do differently to make sure it was equitable? Yes, wait, wait for the mic, sorry. Uh, I think if we realized what was happening, we'd try to unionize earlier and like with more groups, all against group one, or even maybe work with them if they were willing to, because like uh, we didn't really think about even banding together until the very end. And I feel like uh, if we could convince everybody to get together, then like what if we could all just be capitalists, you know? <laughs> yeah. What else would you guys do differently? What I noticed was that um, we had a lot more supplies than everyone else, but like in the sense that it was too much for us. So if we had decided to give our supplies to other groups, we still would have had enough for ourselves, mm. but other uh, but other people would have gotten resources too. And and it was pretty selfish of us to not distribute it. But that's, isn't that how that works with capitalism too? People at the top hoard their resources and they don't distribute them and then people are left to suffer. Um, so if you did have that money and that access, then um, giving it away would be a better option than like having a top 10%. Mm. That's a really, really, really great point. That was amazing. Do you have a comment over here? We have one over here. Thank you. That was great. Um, so like, here's the thing that like I've just been realizing, uh, capitalism has been around since like the beginning of like human history. Mm -hmm. So my question would be like, how would we even fix privilege? Mm -hmm. How would we even go about it? Because at the end of the day, there's always going to be a group that's going to be higher. Mm -hmm. And then in, in, in the end of the day, not everyone's a good person mm -hmm. because people are greedy. So, yeah. how would you even go about fixing that mentality? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Oh, me? Uh, if you were, if it was... I mean, here's the thing, though. I think all of us here, we're all Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. So we already have Islam. That's like our guidelines and our guide rules. But I don't know about, like, <laughs> someone else that's different. Right. So, again, I can't really... Yeah. How, what do you guys think about Yasin's question? Anyone else have any answers to that? It's a really good one. I think a lot of people spend their entire life answering. We have one over here. Um, I guess, like, the thing is you can't really control what other people do. Uh, inevitably, you're going to have people who are immoral or greedy, like Yasin. Oh God, like, shut up, <laughs> like Yasin said. And um, what's it called? Uh, I think the, be the best that we can really do for that is just work on our individual levels to try and distribute our resources as best we can. Because at the end of the day, this stuff, I mean, no form of societal oppression will ever be stricken from society for the rest of history. Like, nobody can guarantee that. It's going to keep on coming up. I guess the idea is just, uh, I think that we can just engage with, like, small battles with it that come up in our lives, you know, and mm -hmm. do what we can to uh, eliminate it at any level that, like, we're actually capable of. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else have any thoughts on Yasin's question? Well, Yasin, it is a million-dollar question, no pun intended. <laughs> awesome. All right, we're going to go ahead and flip over to... Um,
wheel of privilege. You guys want to open that up? Okay, so, and you want to have a pen out? Perfect. So for each identity category on the wheel of privilege, we are going to fill in the outer ring with the most powerful group in society. And you can see the index below for the breakdown of the different categories. And we want to identify the most powerful group for each category. So you want to think about kind of two or three. Um, and then you want to assign the remaining identity categories um, to the rest. So does everybody have it in front? Yeah, it looks like you guys already started. Okay. So number one, identify the privileged groups in the U.S. in each segment of the outer ring. And you guys, like, know, like, you'll put the U.S. on the one the outer ring of the ones that apply. So if age, race, ethnicity, you'll put US on there. A little bit quicker for time. So the next one is identify the privileged groups in the Muslim community in each segment of the middle ring. So the most outer was the US. Now we're going to just the Muslim community. And then the next ring is your identity. So what privilege do you think that you have? Put like me on that. All right, and then the last one is anything that you have in common, your intersectionality, you want to put a little star or shade it in. You just want to showcase the ones that are, um, that intersect. So the U.S., the Muslim community, you and your identity, and then the ones you share. Um, so it's the U.S., the Muslim community, your identity category. So like, um, I'm Algerian, so Arab would be, okay, what, within the Arab community, what identity privilege, then it's you, yourself, you specifically as a person, and then the last one is whichever one intersects, like that there's like a commonality. Does that make sense? Okay, so U.S., you got that one? The Muslims, okay, what's your nationality? Moroccan, so Arab, right? So that would be within the Arab community. So uh, it's, it's whatever you think the, there's privilege in being Arab, for example. All right, you guys, I'm gonna go around and we're gonna have a conversation. Yes. Mohammed, what did you notice when you did this? Um, sorry, <laughs> I asked you a question before the mic. Thank you so much. I have a lot of rights. <laughs> privilege. Privilege. What do you mean by that? What did you notice? What kind of privilege do you have? About like in the U.S., I I do have privilege because you know I was born here, so I have citizenship here, and mm -hmm. um, I'm speaking uh, to the mic. And I have and I speak English, and I'm not like disabled, and um, it's like I could pass as like a white guy or whatever, and the age not so much, but I just realized that because it's the U.S., there's all these factors do affect like how what kind of privileges you have. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing for the Muslim community, like even though it kind of shouldn't be like that, there's still like the what you are can also affect the kind of privileges you have. So that's what I can really That's incredible. That's exactly right, Mohammed. You just crushed the entire workshop. That's exactly it. Right? It's this idea of like, Yasin, you brought it up, right? What do you do with all of that once you realize you have it? So, Mohammed, I turn to you. Okay, you just did this exercise. You go, oh, my God, I have a lot of privilege. What do you do with that? And so that's what our next section is going to be is allyship, right, lending it. Anything else you guys noticed? Sorry, my mic keeps going off me. It looks like, okay, you shaded. Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of commonalities. Do you mind sharing? Uh, so I thought you had to like shade in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you did it right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You did a great job. So I shaded in like gender, age, race. And put the mic towards your mic. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I shaded in gender, age, race, class, language, ability status, and citizenship because those are all things that like affect what you do day to day in the yeah. U.S. Yeah. And then for the Islamic community, I didn't shade in citizenship. Yeah. Because they don't really look at that as much since a lot of people here are immigrants. Yeah. But they do look at the other ones the same. And then yeah. And really get to the personal one. 
Yeah, great job. Crushed it. Can we get someone on this side? Was any of this surprising when you started shading? Any of it not surprising? <laughs> Thank you, Naha. Um, so I guess it wasn't all that surprising because in our day-to-day -day life, we are aware of some things. Mm. Like every time there's an election, we always know that the president will probably be an old white guy. No offense to old white guys, but um, <laughs> it's, it's just the privilege they have is that they're seen as authority, like authority mm -hmm. figures mm -hmm. and um, they're most likely wealthy. And yeah, as, as a female person of color, you probably know that you're gonna have to work harder because people won't view you as, as an authority figure or someone who will get as far in life as other people. Mm -hmm. And the age is something you don't really think about because, I mean, we're, we're all teenagers here. Um, and, but we do know that Sometimes people older than us will have more authority over us. Mm -hmm. But as you grow older, it's less apparent, but it's still there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but race and ethnicity is a very big one here in the U.S. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Naha. I appreciate it. All right, so um, that's just another different kind of lens at everything that we've been talking about leading up to this point. So um, I appreciate you sharing that. I appreciate you guys doing this. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, right? Um, I know it's not always a great feeling to kind of see that, but it, I think it also can be empowering. I go back to Yassine's point at the beginning. What do you do with it, right? So we're going to move on to the next section. I know we only have 20 minutes left, but um, we're going to hear a story from the CETA. And as you listen to the story, I want you to think about social justice, allyship, and privilege. So, does everybody have the story in front of them? Great. Can I get a volunteer to read it? And uh, they're going to pass the mic over, make sure you are loud and clear. The Prophet ﷺ witnessed an incident when he was about 20 years old before the coming of the revelation. A man from Yemen came to Mecca to do some trading. He struck a deal with Qurayshi Meccan, who told him to pass the merchandise he had brought and he would make the payment the next day. When his man came to collect the payment, the Qurayshi dismissed his request and said, I don't know what you're talking about. The man went around for different leaders to get help, but at the time, your loyalty to your tribe, your loyalty was to your tribe and not to truth or justice. The man went to a gathering of leaders at the Kaaba and called out, uh, and called out for men of honor and dignity to help him. A group of them came together and decided they needed to help this man who had been taken advantage of. They made a pact known as Hilf al Fudul, Pact of Virtue, which stated that they will support the rights of all the oppressed, even if it's an outsider. The pact also stated that they would oppose the oppressor, even if he's one of the Quraysh. They approached the Quraysh man who robbed the merchant and demanded he return the goods. Looking back at this incident, the Prophet ﷺ said, if I was called to take part in that pact today with Islam and Sharia established, I would go. Jazakallah khair. That was a beautiful reading of the story. Um, while we're still actually on you, since you have the mic, so sorry if we could pass it back to him. Um, in the context of what we've been discussing today, what does that teach you about um, what our dean says about privilege and what that looks like? What was the first thought after you were done reading the story? We were like, whoa. Like, uh, the first thing I, the first thought thing I thought was, mashallah, even back then, he still had a lot of privileges, mm -hmm. maybe even more than we have now, maybe less. I don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Any thoughts on that story? Great. And if I can have someone read the definition of, oops, I guess allyship didn't come up. 
Oh, perfect. Oh, well, I'll read it since it's right next to me. So um, we're going to conclude by kind of what we, what we think is um, the best kind of next step or next course of action, right, is to be an ally. This is what you do with privilege. And what that means is an ally is a member of the dominant or majority group who questions or rejects the dominant ideology and works against oppression through support of and as an advocate with or for the oppressed population, which was exactly what was exemplified in the story that we just read from the Sita. And that is, at the end be all, what we do with things that we have access to and don't. And I, what I think is amazing about this definition is when we were talking about how would we, would we reimagine this workshop, someone in the um, class said, well, honestly, I would probably, uh, I think it was, it was you in the middle, um, What's your name again, brother? I want to make sure you get credit for this. Is it Sultan? Safan? Safan, you said, um, well, if I knew, honestly, I would have just, like, at the beginning, figured out a way how to collaborate and work together and reimagine what a society looks like when we're co-creating things together. And then you're able to remove um, blocks and barriers. And then to supplement that is Noah's point of, well, hey, I was a part of the majority or dominant group, if I had known, I would have probably questioned or rejected the dominant ideology and worked against oppression, which, Noha, it's insane how that's exactly the definition that you had already said an hour ago, which is incredible. So um, I, I would love to get quick rapid fire examples of ways that you can be an ally today. So I know Mohammed had mentioned a couple of his privileges and kind of things that he realized, oh, wow, like I actually had access to this. What are some quick ways that you can be an ally for another community um, that, you know, you may have privilege then and they don't? I would love this for it to be rapid fire because we are in the last 15 minutes. So if you look at the wheel, one of them that you saw was language and we all know English here. And there's so many people who don't, and there's people who start like ESL programs and stuff like that, that makes them an ally for people who are oppressed for not knowing English. That's amazing. Yep. Helping folks out, lending a hand, volunteering. Sometimes it's even just seeing and acknowledging that it's harder, right? Some, some people just want to be seen, right? And then what do you do with that? So fun. Wait for the mic. Thank you so much for sharing. I guess also just like mentally reaffirming in yourself and understanding that you have uh, the privileges that you do and like um, like and making sure that you're not quick to judge people who might not have those privileges because a lot of times uh, it's really unfortunate but people will call, I don't know, like uh, if there's someone in school who doesn't know English or something as well, they'll call them stupid or mm -hmm. something, right? And they'll... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, sh sh look, look down upon them. But like, then you also have to remember that that person is probably just as smart as you are. They just didn't get the same opportunity mm -hmm. or, um, you know, stuff like that. So it's just reaffirming that mentally. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. I think it segues into a couple of tips and guidelines for being an ally. Um, number one, recognize that being an ally is a process, not an end goal, right? You're not chasing this title. I'm an ally. That's not the point. The point is to be there, right? Truly be there for the process. Um, secondly, and this is super important, being an ally requires you to learn the narratives of the oppressed population. And I would further add from the oppressed population, right? Even if you know a lot about something, you want to hear it from the person that's actually experiencing it. Right, because I think that's where unconscious bias or our own personal narrative can take a spin and we can then recreate someone else's narrative for them, which is not okay. Number three, you shouldn't identify yourself as an ally unless the oppressed population has recognized you as one. This helps eliminate this idea of running around town and claiming you know, um, that you're an ally for this group and um, it then becomes kind of a, a contest of, you know, doing work that's just something that feels good for you and not really about the, about the mission or the goal of what the community um, that you're trying to be an ally to um, is expressing. There are several steps an ally can take to carry out their role more effectively, and so I want to leave you guys with this. 
live with awareness of the world around them, right? So allies are constantly aware and conscious of what's going on around them. Number two, think critically about the world. So this goes back to questioning, right? We don't just accept, but we think, we ask questions. Yasin, I appreciated you asking questions, right? And kind of challenging the space a little bit. I think that's exactly what you should be doing, always and often. Number three, educate yourself on the histories and experiences of target groups from the target groups. Interrupt prejudiced behavior. So when you see something that's not okay, you need to call it out, right? That's what an ally would do. And then last but not least, take action by deciding what needs to be done and then following through. It's not enough to be an ally by tongue, by words, but by action, right? So you want to do, you don't want to just see something or an injustice happening in front of you and then bear witness to it, right? You want to do something about it. So these are just kind of some allyship tips and guidelines. Um, you know, I know we have about, you know, eight minutes left. I'd love for kind of any last thoughts um, on either the exercise or some of the definitions we went through or the story that we shared. Um, what did you guys think? Kind of was this, did you learn something new that you kind of didn't know before you came? I'd love to hear kind of some feedback. I just got like one question. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we choose the um, right allies? Because, you know, there's a lot of oppressed groups out there, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily like right. So how do we like go about choosing the right people to help yeah. support. Yeah, um, I, think, uh, I think that answer is gonna vary person to person, right? Um, I think by no means um, is this workshop intended to say, this is the group or this is what you should be doing or saying. Um, and at the end of the day, it's you know, about what feels true to you um, and what that community needs, right? Um, and I think sometimes a lot of times I would say there's a lot of oppression Olympics, right, where there are a bunch of communities and they're all oppressed and it's all about whose oppression is more. And I just, I think it's not a, it's not a question of whose is more, but, you know, what do these communities individually need? And then how can we allocate resource access and privilege in the same way we thought about these supplies and creating these towers? How do we then distribute that? So it's a great question. And I also think that it's a personal one, and I think it depends, and I also think it's contextual. And I, I think the best start is to start. And through your process, because again, allyship is a process, not an end goal, you'll learn so much. I have learned so much learning how to be an ally for different communities that I may not have known a ton about. And honestly, I've done things that are like probably lots of le lessons to be learned and that's okay that's a part of learning it's a part of the process um, and it's a part of you know you want to be vulnerable because I think that's where you can authentically show up for people it's not about showing up and being kind of the like savior these communities don't need to be saved by anybody and certainly not by those who are privileged so it's about by just being there and and um, holding space sometimes so it's a really good question this is just as much, yeah, this was just as much um, of an experience for us as it was for you guys, um, especially as we played different roles. Um, oh my gosh, I still feel, I don't know about you, Swan, I still feel uncomfortable about the role that, that we played. Yeah, it's not a good one. Um, and it makes me think about, you know, the ways in which I'm also um, experiencing and um, kind of puts me in, in, into a uh, question of like, how are you lending your privilege? Because I definitely have a lot of it. So, um, well, I thank you guys so, so, so much. It took a lot of courage to show up. It took a lot of courage to be involved in this workshop. I know a lot of the stuff that we talk about, you know, while um, we were playing with supplies, they're super, the underlying message is really heavy and it's it's massive and it's honestly so much to pack in two hours don't let this be the only time right that you're exploring this this um the world of oppression and privilege and charity versus justice and the minority um model i i personally just feel super honored to share this space and i thank you guys um for also allowing us to kind of play the roles um i know it wasn't always comfortable so 
Um, but yeah, that's all I have for you guys. Oh my god, I hate the end. <laughs> yeah, can we give a quick round of applause for Fatima real quick? Oh, thank you guys. So in our previous sessions, uh, we've talked about identity. Um, we've talked about our daily experiences with stereotypes, um, with privilege. And today we're going to start our first session on kind of like our community history and our kind of communal history um, and our family history as well for our curriculum. And to do so, we're going to explore, of course, our family histories, our stories, our, you know, our parents, our grandparents, how they came here, what the experiences that they went through and how that kind of shapes and molds us and our future. And also the, you know, the reasons why we're passionate, why we're motivated to create change, to you know, to build off of their legacies and to build, create legacies for our future generations also. So the sessions to come um, for the next few weeks also um, will be about the history of Muslims in America, the history of our local kind of county, and also how we can interact with our, you know, local government and what we're doing and how to be, you know, how to be an ad advocate and also how to build off of the history from those who came before us and to really create change as well. So um, another thing, I had sent out an email. Hopefully you all got a chance to possibly interview um, maybe a parent, a grandparent, you know, an older sibling. Um, if you could. Um, if not, that's totally okay. Um, I know it was kind of last minute. I understand with all the changes that we've had. Um, but use kind of what you already know and what you can already compile to participate in today's discussion and our activities today and I think it'll be really good and you know it'll be really powerful today. So let's kind of before starting let's kind of take a moment to think about um, where today's topic falls in our framework for challenging oppression. So by learning and by learning about and sharing our family histories um, we're combating oppressive knowledge, policies, and of course, real world consequences. So as you all remember, we had our knowledge power charts from I think it was the first week or the second week that we had created. Um, and they had the last one that we made kind of focused on, um, you know, real world changes that we can make that are positive and um, how to combat, you know, the different stereotypes that we had mentioned. And just thinking about today, like on that knowledge power chart, remember we had the knowledge in one section, the policies, and then real world consequences also. So thinking about the knowledge we have today will be focused on artistic and cultural production, and then also relationships and storytelling. And then um, obviously we're not working with direct policies today, but our real world, real world consequences, right? So creating spaces for collective hearing, for storytelling, for you know, um, understanding each other and empowering each other as a group and uplifting each other as a group based off of our histories and based off of what we can learn about each other as well. Awesome, and again, as always um, with every section, I um, just wanna show everybody the being that we have, kind of our community guidelines, the, you know, the values that kind of guide us um, throughout our session and throughout, you know, things that we carry on after, out of here also, right, in our daily lives too, of course. So things like respect, um, open mind, diverse perspectives, um, empathy, collaboration, and then, of course, the on the outside of our being, we have, you know, the values that we don't, you know, don't want to carry on, don't want to bring here or outside arrogance, animosity, bad manners, etc. So just kind of remember our community guidelines for this session and for all our other sessions as we always kind of mentioned before um, as well. So today our learning objectives are to explore the different ideas that we have of home and of homeland and what this means to us as Muslims that are living in America and for many of us as first generation or second generation Muslims, what that means to us and what our history means um, in our daily lives. And then we're also here to identify, you know, the larger social, political, and economic factors, of course, which have shaped our life as in the previous sessions too. And finally, to learn your family history and to be able to share and teach others about it and kind of explore that, right? So to identify the larger factors, you know, again, the social, political, economic factors, which have shaped your life, um, which have shaped your family's life, um, their plight, and also those that have shaped our community members as well. 
so our kind of schedule we have our you know we did our roll call our housekeeping items um, and then I have a you know kind of like a short Islamic story that I want to share with you all I think is important um, just a little you know a little story and then I will we'll have a spiritual bloodlines handout that I'll pass out to everybody that we'll read and have a short discussion on and then our main big activity today will be our poetry activity which I think is really awesome and which is um, which will be really fun to do as a group as well. And yeah, there are learning objectives as well. And yeah, so I wanted to start today with kind of like a short story, just to think, just to get us thinking and just to, you know, think about our values as well, our values of kindness, empathy, understanding, and basic compassion. So. The story is called The Old Lady Who Threw Rubbish. So during um, the Prophet Sallallahu time, um, there, he had this neighbor who would always give him a hard time and who would always, uh, always make it a point to really go out of her way to give him, you know, to make his life harder. So every morning um, on, on cue, he would walk by her home and she would throw rubbish at him or trash at him in his direction, oftentimes hitting him. And every day, you know, he kind of shrugged it off. He didn't make a big deal about it. He, you know, he didn't let it bother him. He didn't let it create any animosity towards her. He didn't hate her. He didn't, you know, want bad for her. He didn't wish bad. He always prayed for her as well. So this was a daily thing, a daily thing, a weekly thing. It was a, you know, it was on cue. And then one day, as Prophet, the Prophet ﷺ was walking out by her house, um, he noticed that he wasn't hit by any rubbish. And he thought it was odd. He said, I wonder if something happened. I wonder what's going on. And then another day went on. He still didn't hear from her. He still didn't experience that. So he, one day he went out there in the morning and he knocked on her door. And he heard a really faint voice saying, you know, who is it? Come in. You know, um, I'm back here. And so he went in and he saw that the lady was really sick. And he saw that she was suffering. And what he did, what the Prophet did, was that he went to sit by her and he prayed with her and he prayed for her to get better and he prayed for Allah to forgive her and to, you know, grant her understanding and to take care of her as well. And, you know, we think about the different experiences that he had with, you know, dealing with her and with her throwing trash at him, with her, you know, pestering him. He could have easily, you know, wanted, you know, wish bad for her or could have easily been upset with her or, you know, created some form of you know problems with her but he didn't instead he prayed and he was compassionate and the idea of you know he took care of his neighbor even though you know even if they're different or even if they're having struggle he still made it a point to take care of them and to try to understand and eventually um based off that story um the that lady did eventually convert to islam a little bit down the line as well and she understood which was you know which is incredible um, and that's a story we think about family history. That's a story that my mom has been telling me for, gosh, since probably since I was a really, really, really young kid. Um, and she's told me and my, I have two older sisters as well who are, you know, who are quite a bit older than me. But a story that she's been sharing with us all, just to kind of get us to think about things a little bit and to put everything into perspective as well. So I kind of listed out a few of the. Um, kind of the general themes and kind of like the things that I want you all to think about um, here and then as, you know, as we go on in our daily lives also. But just looking at the values from the Prophet in the story and even in other stories as well, just the ideas of being patient and also steadfast um, in the face of adversity and even when it's dealing with other people or you know, a lot of the arguments or a lot of the issues that you have with other people still being passionate and still being steadfast and, you know, wanting the best and doing what you can to be kind also. And then, of course, compassion, as I mentioned, and, you know, really emphasizing and really thinking about trying to understand, right, instead of using vengeance or being vengeful and, you know, creating more animosity or creating more hatred, right? And then finally, we have the idea of, you know, building connections and relationships and the more we foster them of course the more they will help us in our future and the more you know it's good to be kind and it's good to be you know build relationships with as many people as possible of course and it's something that'll help you all as you get older too and great um 
So next, we'll have kind of our first uh, handout here today, inshallah. Um, if I can get um, Samina or Mariam, if I can get you guys up here really quick. Everybody's so quiet all the time. Great, and then I think we all have that. Would anybody like to volunteer to to be our volunteer to kind of read the story for today? Anybody? I'd rather not choose someone to do so. <laughs> Anyone? Awesome. Yeah, let me get you the microphone for you. Wait, can you guys? Okay, there we go. Um, put yourself in the shoes of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. You have begun receiving revelation from Allah through Gabriel, peace be upon him, and you have had some time to gain perspective about your mission. All your life, you have walked past the Kaaba, a monument that is beloved to your tribesmen and special to the clan of Hashim, from which you are sprung. You partook in its rebuilding and resolved the conflict between the tribal chiefs when they fought over who would place the black stone in its position. You had them share by carrying it on a piece of cloth, each tribal leader holding a corner until you placed the black stone in its place with your own hands. The Kaaba has always been dear to you, a connection to Allah, but also to your family, which you lost at a young age. Your forefather, Qusay, was the one who had introduced the practice of Nifadha to this city, giving food and water to the pilgrims of the Kaaba. And it was your grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, who had restored the well of Zamzam for all the pilgrims to quench their thirst. It was he who had prayed for the Kaaba's protection when the jealous governor from Yemen tried to destroy it with his elephant. And now you inherit the spiritual legacy of Abraham, peace be upon him, who built this Kaaba centuries ago. Now you will restore the Kaaba to glorifying Allah's oneness. By Allah's will, you will rid this place of idol worship, just like your spiritual forefathers, Abraham, and all of the prophets had challenged the idols of their time. It is not just the stone statues themselves that you will remove, but the abuse of power and the tribal um, elitism which those idols represent. Your task will not be easy. You ask Allah for help and assistance in this task. Our family histories are a mixed bag. Among our ancestors were those who believed and those who associated partners with Allah. They did noble and righteous deeds and they made mistakes. Allah calls upon us to critically reflect on um, al-awwalun, those who came before. Take inspiration and faith from their examples and challenge falsehood and oppression that is passed down from one generation to the next. How does your family history move or inspire you towards just, injustice? Or justice sorry. Awesome, and thank you for reading that for us. And so, um, first kind of first thoughts, does anyone have any, you know, first thoughts about this after reading this? Um, any, you know, anything they found interesting or anything they'd like to share um, based off of this, based off of this story, anybody? Or any of the other stories that we've heard before or anything that we could think about? Anyone? If not, no, that's okay also. But um, I asked you all then that final question that uh, that was read also. So, um, in your you know, as we get going today, how does your family history move or inspire you towards justice? How does the um, to all of you? How does the experience of your parents or your grandparents or your family, you know, your family history as a whole? How does that inspire you today? Anyone have anything they would like to share? Come on. Yeah, I know somebody has a story or something. 
If not, um, Samina, would you like to share? <laughs> well, rushing to share, I figure I'm going to take the microphone. No, I was actually thinking when I was hearing this story, you know, oftentimes you, you, hear from people they're like oh well my family did this or my family you know was they helped found the mosque they did this and it's like you know the process on he was so humble he's not looking at it as though like hey like I like we did all this stuff and so that's why we're like should be listened to and but it was really also mashallah people followed his leadership because of the content of his character the person who is he didn't have that pride you know that I think a lot of us may have if we had such of a family history as well you know um, so I thought that was beautiful and but um, you would ask the question how does your family history move or inspire you to do justice so for me I'm just gonna come to the front because this is so weird um, for me like my my parents they uh, had moved to San Diego and they were one of the first Muslims, you know, over there. And mashallah, they helped start the community over there. They helped start the masjid over there. But one of the things that I, the reason why I got involved with care is because I saw that. I saw that mashallah, like they recognized that our place in this community isn't just to make money or have fun or whatever, but it was to really establish the community and help out and help others. And um, that's kind of why I started in what I was doing. And I remember um, when I was young, there was the Gulf War was happening. And a lot of, um, you know, hatred, discrimination, a lot of things were being said about Islam and Muslims. But there wasn't an organization in place to help defend the Muslim community or to speak out or to like, you know, go and talk to the media. My father was one of those people that, I mean, I think people, um, had asked for him to go like on camera and talk about something. And one of the things he said was, you know, the Muslim ummah is like a body. If one part of it hurts, it's like the, the whole body suffers. And so that really stuck to me that that's why we need to be involved and engaged whenever any part of our ummah is hurting. And so, alhamdulillah, that kind of started me on my trajectory to being involved with the community, being involved with care. And 17 years later, I'm still here today. So, and that's my story. And, and y'all, y'all can like, if you have even a short story, it'd be nice if you can share something about your family as well. We won't bite. Anybody have anything to add? One. If not, I mean, I can, I can share a brief, uh, a little bit about like my history, things that get me thinking. So, um, my parents um, from India and Pakistan. Um, my parents uh, growing up were extremely, uh, really extremely poor, um, and they had very, very little. Um, and I think about a lot of the stories. Like my, my mom would tell me, for instance, um, she would tell me that um, once a year on Eid. They would get um, with her and her siblings. She had um, a sister, older sister, and an older brother. And every year on Eid, they would get a bottle of shampoo, and they would make that bottle of shampoo together last for the whole year until the next Eid. Um, and some of the stories I think about. Um, and when they moved here, um, they started in L.A. In, a in the Culver City area, and there they lived in a little like one bedroom, little tiny like back apartment that they had, or like an extension. Um, and my grand my grandfather would go to work from from morning to night, and so would my grandmother. And they would take the bus, and they would go multiple stops to get to work at a factory. And just think about the stories that my mom would tell me. Like um, they didn't have much. Um, she would one day they uh, walked their walk into school, and she had they had found like a mattress that was left outside and. They were so excited to see that that they went back at night, like later, later in the week, and brought that mattress back to their home. And just thinking about the humble beginnings and the humble starts that they had, um, and how hard that they worked. And just thinking about also my own life, like my parents, um, they worked, you know, nonstop, and I like I barely saw. Like my dad was always working as a kid, and my mom would too. And just thinking about those, you know 
concepts of how much they emphasize, like how they kind of gave up their dreams to, or their dream was to see us pursue, you know, our education, to put us through college, to see us grow, and they put their whole lives into us. So just think about that really motivates me and inspires me and kind of brings me here, brings me to, I got my, uh, I graduated from UC Riverside last year, actually, um, and pursuing that and then come into care, um, wanting to work with, you know, youth development and working with all of you, of course, which has been really great and just trying to do more and inspiring to build off of their legacy, right? And to kind of, you know, make their dreams come true, right? Also, so just a little story, something to think about. Um, does anyone have, you know, we've mentioned a few, does anyone have any anything that they would like to share? Maybe a little bit at all? Come on, y'all. I know I've been working with you all for a few weeks here. I know a lot of you have stories. There you go. Um, my brain was empty until you said that story because it reminded me of my maternal grandfather. Um, he had a very similar background in Pakistan. Um, he grew up like in a one bedroom house, but he had like um, a good like five siblings and uh, a large family and um, they weren't very educated and well off. And actually his father had passed away, so his mother was single with all the children. Um, and um, his brothers decided one day that they would sacrifice um, their schooling and work to earn money so that their little brother, my grandfather, would be able to get himself an education where he could support the family. So um, my grandfather was very dedicated and he would, they didn't have like electricity in the house, but he would use like the street lamps outside to like study and eventually all that hard work paid off and he became a doctor and he was able to open his own clinic in Pakistan and help um, all the less fortunate that couldn't afford, afford uh, medical care. And there's obviously a lot of injustice when it comes to um, the lower class not being able to um, provide for their family and get basic medical care that for us we really do take for granted. So um, that story has like always inspired me um, where he just used a single street lamp to make himself a doctor and really like um, really utilized his brother's sacrifice and made them proud. It's incredible and may Allah reward um, him and everyone that he's helped also. And just the idea that Sabina mentioned, right? Um, when like as a Muslim body or as a community, right? When something is, you know, you know, we think about the communal aspects and how we dedicate, you know, dedicate our lives and our struggles to helping everybody else out and using our struggle and using our stories to really make it a point to take care of everyone else and to, you know, it's a community thing. It's just like the values of Prophetalism also, right? The value of taking care of, you know, everyone else and doing what you can to, to do that. It's very, you know, a lot of our Muslim values as well. So thank you. Um, anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Uh, my mom's dad, so my granddad, moved from Yemen to England to get uh, more money for his family and eventually my grandma and all her um, moved to England as well and that's where they had their kids and my granddad had to work um, all the time, a very like laborious job and it wasn't, it was a very difficult job but he worked all day to provide for his family and him and my grandma, they didn't know any English, so they had to raise their kids in a country where they didn't know the culture or the language. They, you know, my grandma had to go to the market and, I don't know, figure out how to buy whatever without any English. They faced racism, of course, um, but because of their sacrifices um, and what they did, my <clears throat> now I get to live a good life. I was born in England and me and all my cousins um, because of the sacrifice they put in. Uh, we have a strong Yemeni community there, but now I moved to America. So, and we only got to move to America because of the sacrifices my granddad put in so my mom could have a good life. So she could provide a good life for me. And so that's it. 
Thank you. And that's right on cue with, you know, what I want everybody to kind of think about. So a lot of these like immigrant stories, right? And a lot of these, a lot of our older generations, whether it's our parents or our grandparents or whoever it might be kind of laying the foundation for us, right? And how we can build off of that. So kind of something I want you all to think about is that, you know, that immigrant struggle and, you know, what our previous generations have experienced and how they've used that to kind of guide us and how we can take from that also um, something that we're gonna you know we're gonna focus on throughout here and a lot of us have you know those similar stories of course and kind of came from those same beginnings um, and one final story does anyone have um, any final thoughts or final things that they would like to share anyone from this side or from or from here again no okay that's okay um, thank you for those of you that did share um, they're Definitely inspiring stories and, you know, perfect on, right on cue with what I would like us all to kind of focus on today. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and lead us to our next activity and kind of the main focus on today and today's work. We have our uh, poetry activity. Um, so I kind of want to briefly show you all something before and the importance of art and the importance of um, reflection and cultural reflection also um, see if I can minimize this real quick just one share something with you all so just really quick um, just think about art and kind of the different uh, reflections and the importance of it. Um, a little while ago, I worked on a kind of an art exhibit that um, opened up in Hawaii, actually. And it's at the Shangri-La in Honolulu. And um, we opened a virtual exhibit during, during the start of the pandemic that was focused, it's called the American Muslim Futures Exhibit. So it was a national exhibit and we took um, inquiries from all around all around the country and different uh, casting calls from all around the country for art and it was focused on liberation uh, liberation power justice and it was called the american muslim futures right so we took the visions of 23 muslim and allied artists and um, their visions of what a just america looked like and it was really cool so just thinking about the power that art has and how to use our voice and our stories in a different way that can inspire other people and kind of bring together other people and activism and, or as I like to call it, artivism, right? And using that in social movements and in, you know, and building um, cultural movements as well. So just kind of briefly show some of the different artworks that we worked on was pretty cool. Um, and got to talk to a lot of the artists as well. Just something to kind of think about um, in different songs as well. So. Just wanted to briefly show you all the power of art and what that could do for us, right? Okay. Well, great. So for our poetry activity, um, just getting you all to think of um, one way, of course, in which we can reflect on our family histories and our struggles is through art which we've mentioned um, quite a bit. So today we're going to create uh, collective poems, or as we call them, family poetries, that bring together um, shared themes from our family histories and from our you know, experiences. Um, but first, before that, i um, going to pass out um, these green strips here um, in a sec, if you want to hand this out. Um, so we're going to write out um, for all of us, we're going to write out three lines of poetry, if you want to hand out three to everybody. Um, three lines of poetry that are related to our family histories. So whether or not um, we've all got a chance to interview or got a chance to talk to anybody, use you know, kind of what you already know and what you've already, you know, um, already are aware of to kind of really guide you here. So what we're going to do is um, on, we're going to write each line each line of poetry, they don't have to be interconnected in any way. Um, on a separate piece of on a separate um, piece of the green strap paper that we have, and these poems, they can be you know they could be direct quotes, um, whether it's from an interview or it's from direct quotes that your parents or your grandparents or whoever it might be have shared with you 
in the past or that you know of. Um, they could be moments that were maybe really powerful or inspiring for your family. Um, or any kind of you know creative reflection even about your own history or your own family's history as well. So again, um, your lines of poetry, right, they don't need to be in any kind of order or kind of build off of each other. They can, but they don't have to, of course. Um, and we'll give about, I don't know, maybe 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Yeah, I think we got yeah, 10 to 15 minutes here to really think and um, write, you know, write our lines out. And then after that, we're going to divide um, into different discussion groups and kind of reflect on our histories with each other. So feel free. Um, and we'll be walking around. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, again, we're always here. So I'll give you all about 10 minutes or so to kind of think and write out um, lines of poetry. So. OK, and Mariam's going to go around and hand out um, a piece of butcher paper to everybody. And um, this will be kind of like the main, you know, our main uh, presentation kind of aspect that we're going to be focusing on. But as Mariam hands them out, um, real quick before I kind of explain the, uh, the breakout discussion that we're going to have with everybody, um, if I could jump to this really quick. Um, if everyone can see up front here, we have, uh, it's, it might be a little hard to see, but what I want to do with these, uh, with these, this butcher paper is we're going to draw, um, each group is going to draw one of these trees, if you can see up here. Um, we'll hand out some markers as well. Um, Murray, do you have some markers back there? I might have them up here, actually. I got them. Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to draw out one of these trees for each group, right? And I want them to kind of look something, you know, something like that. Um, that's going to be kind of like the main, um, how all our trees are going to look like with our lines of poetry, as you can kind of already kind of see. Um, and don't title it yet. Just kind of draw them out like that. And we'll join you all as well. We'll do our own poetry also. And Mariam's going to hand out um, the markers. And we'll be walking around to facilitate as well. Um, so in your groups for now, though, while, while you do that also, I kind of want to get you all to think about um, some different questions and some different, you know, kind of guide your discussion and kind of guide you all to kind of talk to each other and get to know each other as well and get to know each other's, you know, background and, you know, what's powerful about us and what we've experienced and, you know, what inspires us today. So I have a list of questions that are up here that I want you all to kind of use to guide your discussion, all right? Um, and as you go through them, um, again, I understand we didn't all get to interview somebody, so kind of just think about your own, share your own experiences also. Um, just get creative with it, right? I kind of, I also want you all to think about this final question that I have in bold, and, or not question, but this final like idea that I have in bold that's also underlined, right? So think about these themes. Um, identify three shared themes or common threads from your family, from your group's family history, so it'll be important. So we can all go ahead, inshallah. We'll have about 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so. So, and we'll be walking around again. Okay, everybody. If I can get everyone's attention really quick, um, just for a few minutes, um, I kind of want to get everybody to think about some of the things that we've shared about before we kind of like really dig into assembling assembling our poetry together, which many of you have already started, which is, which is good though, I like it. I like the enthusiasm for it, but just to kind of think before, um, before really going into it, but based off of our group stories, um, I just want to hear from you all, like what are some of the themes that have come up um, in our stories here? Um, some of the themes that we can think about that are important, that we've noticed. Um, does anyone, would anyone like to share really quick? Come on, y'all. Do you have the microphone, Mary? Uh, sacrifice. Sacrifice, yeah. Uh, education. Education. Anyone else? OK, if not, um, some of the ones that um, when I'm walking around listening to everyone talk and just thinking on my own also, we think about like Iman, faith, right? 
and of course sacrifice um, and then also um, not giving up right kind of like a theme also um, sabar um, patience doesn't necessarily have to be like you know like an Islamic value but it could be anything right but those are important of course um, Tawakkal also mentioned faith in Allah faith in the plan um, and then I kind of want to jump to that last question. I think this is um, probably the most important that I want you all to think about. Of course, it's all important, but in your groups and in your experience, um, why is the process of learning and also sharing our family history so important? Um, why are these spaces important for us? Um, what does it kind of make you think about? What Does it inspire you a little bit? Um, anybody? <laughs> Anyone? Everyone's so quiet today and like scaring me. <laughs> no, I, I can, um, I guess I can kind of answer that also. Um, so I think about this process of learning and, you know, sharing our histories and you kind of see how much similarity, I guess, we all have and a lot of the stories and a lot of the struggles that we all have shared. Um, we all have the kind of immigrant stories, right? And also it's, I think it's really incredible to see like, to look at ourselves, right? All of us, like we're all the we are all the like kind of like outcome or kind of like the the final results of you know of these struggles and of these you know this pursuit for happiness for justice. Like we're all living that. We're all living that dream that a lot of our parents, our grandparents, our ancestors that they had. Like we should all like of course like you know continue to be humble and thankful, but also like understand that like we are living the dreams of a lot of our parents and a lot of our ancestors. So, you know, let, let that inspire us and, you know, kind of drive, you know, as we, as we grow and drive, as we pursue our careers and whatnot to kind of remember that concept and really uh, think about how that inspires us and motivates us. But since y'all aren't feeling like sharing as much today and I won't call on anybody also, um, we'll spend the next like, uh, I don't know, spend the next like 10 minutes or so. Again, um, I see many of you have already assembled like our trees here, but we've already sketched out the poetry, right? Um, and then you're going to place the lines of poetry um, in any order, as many of you have already kind of done, and flow, um, any order that makes kind of sense. And then also like get creative, like this group um, back here is um, incredible and I, you all are too like with how creative everyone's been but continue to add on to it make your tree look unique make it look cool you know get excited with it and then also I want you all to kind of choose um, a title that is really symbolic to your poetry something that's symbolic to all of you still so think about those themes and those ideas and just put the, the title could be anywhere it could be at the top um, wherever makes sense for you all so I'll give you all about 10 minutes. Let me see what time we got. Yeah, um, I'll give you all about 10 minutes or so. And then we will, of course, at the end, present, OK? So yeah, I know. Ah, so get excited about that. All right, everybody. Um, if I can get everyone's attention really quick. So hopefully we all got everything together. I did walk around and looked like we're all about ready to present. Um, would anyone, would any group, we could all stay in our groups here. Um, would any group like to go first in presenting? Anyone? Awesome. Are y'all going to do a rap like you said or no? No rap? Someone was teasing a rap, but hold on one sec. Let me get you guys a microphone really quick. He's not presenting. <laughs> He's not presenting, bro. He's just here for emotional support. All right. <laughs> okay. Got it? Yeah, all right. Bismillah. Okay. It's bigger than black and blue. You know? That's our title. A determined village boy, studying for success, wanting to help his family, um, it? achieving his dreams, and making his family proud. Education creates a path towards justice and activism. 
When my parents left their whole lives in Bangladesh just to receive a better education so they could provide for both their children plus parents back home. Uh, when my mom would walk home in the snow every day from her uh, laborious, low-paying job but never gave up, taking risks are key, is, uh, are key to success. All right, this is uh, our poem. All, all trust is in Allah, stuck in my cell, thinking there's no way to get out until, boom, Allah has different plans for you. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. Yeah, saved by a miracle, all in a million chance. The reality is unbelievable. Wallahi, all trust is in Allah. All right. And my family came from nothing. They'll return. To, um, they they turned it into something. They'll they'll return to nothing. Um, life is short. Let's do our best in front of our Lord. Uh, all right. This last part. Yeah. Uh, the only way you can come that you can help others <laughs> is to help yourself first. Sometimes change from um, the norm is my biggest necessity for making life a lot of uh, impact. Yeah, there we go. See that? I tried my best. All right, you. Oh, nah, bro. We don't do albums, bro. That's haram, bro. We doing the sheets. Okay, and next group. So we kind of started off, oh, sorry, we kind of started off with like our basic um, foundations and virtues. So I said that always strive to do the best you can in your life, even when things seem hard because the end result will always be worth it. The second thing that I said was education is one of the most powerful tools that a person can have in their lives. And then the third thing was that be grateful for all the things that you have in your life whether they're big or small, and always remember that the more you give to the world, the more you get back. Uh, okay. Across three cities and four different homes, my family's home has always been filled with books. The value and love for education passed generation by generation has influenced myself and many more before me. Uh, admiration for others' good deeds never fails to inspire me to do to do the same and to be consistent in all my deeds. Next, we move on to a set of examples that derive from these principles and virtues. My grandmother came from a place far away where servants stood waiting for her every wish to a place called America where she soon realized she alone would be cooking every dish. Unwilling to be labeled as ignorant she started her own Montessori school, at last positioning herself so she could begin to help the less fortunate. Uh, my grandmother moved to the US, which uh, allowed me to be part of a more diverse community. Um, my father was beat up in school for being a, a colored child, and I figured that I don't actually know all the countries that my family is from, which could, like, I don't know, I need more knowledge. So we titled this palm tree the core of achievement because these foundation, um, foundational principles and examples were the root of um, our family's achievement, which is the next generation's um, opportunity for education in this country and being able to have privilege that they did not have. And um, some um, points that led to this title were the similar themes that we all had of sacrifice and ambition and of our um, ancestors utilizing the resources that they had in the situations they were in and trying to attain education to help themselves. Thank you.
Look at that palm tree, that's pretty cool, no lie. Um, anyone else? Next group? Awesome, there we go. Um, so our poem, or our tree, is kind of organized at the base where it's like, it's the struggles of our grandparents and our parents leaving their home countries. And then towards the middle of the tree, we start looking at the work of our parents and how much effort they had to put and sacrifice to get to where we are, and that's where the leaves are, which is the fruit of their work and our reflections on how grateful we are. So I'm gonna read like a few of the poems, not all of them. So at the base, there's one that says, uh, I'm just gonna do this. Breaking barriers and starting over, everything they thought was earned and erased. Everything that they thought they earned was erased. My grandfather was the first leaving, was the first to move, leaving India for new Middle Eastern ground. And then towards the middle, it's like one shared bathroom, a Snickers candy bar split between sibling, between six siblings, a craving for more, something they couldn't afford. And then as we finally reach the, the top where we see the benefits, as I sit with the resources of the bay, I wonder what's next on my route. A turning point, all the children they have grown up. They can rest now. Don't forget to look up. It all comes from above. Thank Allah for he is full of mercy and love. Did it for the what? For the vine? <laughs> I think vines before before everyone's talking here, but Okay. And then we have three left. Two left of the R's too, of course. So uh, we labeled our tree the journey, and I'm gonna read some of the poems we have. So the grandfather who endures and builds an orphanage for children with no family, that grandfather is the person who inspired me, his little princess. And this one says, the grandfather who can't see his wife, daughters, sons, grandsons, and his two little princesses. The grandfather who is not allowed into the USA. Uh, when my grandfather uh, moved to America, he changed his last name, which affected mine. Uh, my father was the first person in his family to get a college education. Okay. My dad grew up in Syria and moved to Canada for university. As a child, my father still went through taking care of his family. My mother used to live in Saudi Arabia during wartime. They eventually moved to Canada where my grandfather wrote about his experience. My family is split because of visa. Oh, sorry. My family is split between India, England, and, in and the USA. My family is full of doctors helping out each other. Step back onto this new place, America. So many mixed feelings working as a child to help their family out and they have hard workers. New thoughts, new feelings, inside fear and only a suitcase was brought. Anyone want to read the themes? Okay, so the three themes are beginnings, immigration and change. <laughs> okay, so um, our tree died, so we wrote all of its personalities. <laughs> So, um, it was alive from 2022 to 2022, and it lived for two minutes. <laughs> um, it graduated um, high school in that time, too. Um, yeah, and it was a mother, a teacher, a grandmother, <laughs> a daughter. Um, <laughs> Okay, um, so our tree is called the Ladder of Dreams, and um, that's symbolized by the many rungs, um, which contains which contains the uh, the struggles and like sacrifices that our parents or grandparents had to go through in order to get us here at the top of the ladder. Um, so basically, uh, it shows how every single part and every single story um, makes up who we are today. And uh, we're currently at the top of the tree, um, enjoying like the fruit of their work. Uh, even though the roots symbolize our family's roots, and um, it it 
naturally progresses to the top, basically. So, yeah. Okay, so my poem I wrote about how my grandpa, Gedo Ahmed, he moved to England. He had faced a lot of racism there, so he had to be resilient. And he worked long hours for a better life. Um, so did my parents. They sacrificed for me and my siblings so that um, my grandparents and parents uh, sacrificed for generations to come. And my mom said to me and my siblings, we don't have family here, so we have to build our own community wherever we go. In my poem, um, my parents, um, they had to work hard um, to come to the U.S. for a better and a better and easier life. And they did. So, and then they moved here to give us a better and easier life. Um, for me, I focused more on like a, the story of my grandparents who um, uh, sacrificed uh, like many things and uh, people as well to get to um, give my parents a decent life who uh, in Pakistan who then moved to America to give me and my sibling a better life. Um, and I, in my poem, I was mostly appreciating um, the blessed life that I have due to the, uh, the sacrifices that they made. Um, my grandparents, they could barely afford a car and they worked hard and moved to Wyoming so that they could help me and my, me, my, my dad and his siblings get into good education and go to college. And my dad moved to California to help us be around a good Muslim community, unlike what he had to go through. Uh, I guess my parents sacrificed leaving their home country of Afghanistan because there was like a war going on. So they wanted like a safe place for me to live. So they all, like, they left and then they eventually ended up meeting back in California. Um, my parents sacrificed his uh, uh, friends and family and like uh, to go through, to get um, us to where we are today and like um, the struggles and everything that he had to go through. So, yeah. yeah, that's it. And then finally we have ours. Mariam, would you like to? Last, but certainly not least. Okay, so ours is called Rooted in Family and Faith, and the way we organized it is um, our poems go, well, maybe I should read them first. <laughs> um, from the wretches of the earth, there grew a single rose. Our purpose is not to make money, but to make a difference. Separated from wife and baby, my father would leave to finish his studies at Cal Poly and take odd jobs looking loading trucks to support his family he only saw on the weekends. An engineer, an immigrant, a grocery store owner, a chauffeur from sports practice to Girl Scout meetings, and so much more. My dad is whatever his kids need him to be. Six people sharing one room in Pakistan to now having a five bedroom house in the US after years of struggle and hardship. She wakes up hours before I do and is still working long after I've gone to sleep. She works two jobs and still never missed a single basketball game or Girl Scout meeting. All I have to do is call her name. My mother's love for her children would defy gravity. Two continents, three flights, 5,000 miles away, connected by more than a shared name, bound by more than blood, a family built from love. I remember she told us, my children are my dream, all the trees, tri trials, all the trials, the hardship, were worth seeing your smiles. Tawakkul, tawakkul, tawakkul. Fear not, for Allah is the greatest of all planners. Awesome, that was great, um, great everybody. And kind of, as we, that kind of wraps up most of our uh, 
most of our class session today, but um, briefly, um, in thinking about these different stories and thinking about these different poems that we all um, and that we've all heard, um, does anyone have any final thoughts or final ideas that they would like to share? Again, um, one more chance on the microphone for anybody. Um, anyone? Anyone? If not, um, just something that um, resonates with me is just thinking about how similar a lot of our stories are and how similar a lot of our experiences are. So that concept of uh, kind of that communal struggle, but also how a lot of us work for communal like success and for taking care of one another, right? And the concepts of, like this group, for instance, talked about the latter, right? Um, how, you know, the, how our ancestors or our parents, whatever generation built built from the ground up and then where kind of, you know, we, I guess, kind of are like the, enjoy the fruit of that or fruits of their labor. But also that doesn't mean that our lives are, you know, entirely perfect or that we're, you know, we have everything. We also struggle. We also experience a lot. Um, and oftentimes it looks a little different than our previous generations, but that, you know, never discount what you experience also. But continue to build off for the next, for our next generations and for people and inspire people around you also. Um, but yeah, that about wraps up our um, class today. Um, thank you all for um, bear, sticking with me through all these changes and through the schedule changes also. Um, inshallah, next week we will be joined by, I believe, Aziz Akbari, who is an elected official. And we'll be talking about engaging with our local government, so it should be really good. Um, so look forward to seeing you all next week, inshallah. Um, of course, again, as always, we have lunch that is going to be outside in our usual spot, as always, for everyone. So great job. Great class, everybody. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Aziz. Uh, you guys, first of all, are remarkably quiet. So hopefully we'll change that today and uh, we'll get you guys engaged in the session. Um, I'll first introduce myself to give you a sense of uh, why I'm here. We're going to be talking a lot about the government today. Um, and we're going to learn about what the government does, the structure of government, how a bill becomes a law, and, and uh, we'll kind of take the conversation from there and we'll see what, what issues we can get into today. Um, a little background uh, about myself. Uh, I grew up here in the Bay Area, grew up in Fremont. Anyone from Fremont? few people okay cool where are is everyone else from like the Pleasanton Livermore area Dublin San Ramon most of you guys are from this area awesome awesome well uh, so a little bit about me um, I first got involved in government when I was 18 um, I ran for mayor when I was uh, when I was 18 years old I just graduated from high school uh, and I felt like I was very disappointed in what our local government was doing with, um, a, you know, a lack of representation, uh, a lack of kind of thought for the future and, and planning for how we would improve the Bay Area um, and make it a more attractive place for people to come and live and work and, uh, and, and raise a family and all of that. So I, I ran for mayor of Fremont. Uh, this was back in 2012. Um, I didn't win, uh, otherwise we'd be having a much different conversation today. Um, but I did stay very involved in government. And so uh, I ended up serving as a consumer affairs commissioner for Alameda County when I was 19. Um, and then at 22, I got elected to local government. Uh, so I got elected to the Alameda County Water District's Board of Directors. Uh, we service the, the Bay Area, particularly Alameda County, uh, and we deliver water. So all the water that you, you drink, uh, that you use to bathe, uh, all of the water that reaches your home and that reaches businesses, we help make sure that there's enough water and that we can actually deliver that water. So that's, that's some of the work that I do. Um, when I got elected, I was actually the youngest Muslim American to get elected within the United States. Um, and so, um, you know, hopefully that, that, that's been broken now and, and we're, we're going to keep uh, getting younger and younger Muslims involved in government. But I really believe that it's incumbent on young people, young Muslims in particular, that we need to, to advocate for ourselves and we need to make sure that we're 
uh, we're pushing forward policies that we think uh, align with with our values. And so, so that's that's really how I got involved and why I stay involved in government. And I, I think we're going to have a really, really fun conversation today about why government matters and the ways that you guys can have an impact uh, locally and uh, and beyond that as well. Um, let me first start with a question. Uh, have any of you guys ever thought about running for office or have been interested in government by a show of hands? Yeah, you've thought about running for office? What, what got you, what, what kind of inspired you in that way? The fact that I looked around and I saw there were quite a few issues that actually needed to be changed. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know, for instance, school budgets. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Uh, anyone else ever thought about running for office or, or uh, anything like that? How about this? Have any of you guys been to a school board meeting or a city council meeting or some kind of like a, a public meeting where, where you got to listen to and interact with other electeds? Anyone ever been to a session like that? You have. Do you want to tell me a little bit about, about that session? Yeah. Um, so I went to a council meeting because um, I was in this organization called the, the Youth Voter Movement, mm -hmm. and we were going around schools in the Bay Area and getting people pre-registered to vote. Awesome. And so we went there to get like a certificate, but we also like sat in and they were like, um, sort of, um, coming up with, uh, ideas on what to do with the elder population, like a new community center for them. So, okay. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, what city was this? Fremont. In oh, this is in city. Fremont. Fremont. Okay. Fantastic. Anyone else been to been to uh, any kind of session like that? No. All right. Well, uh, hopefully we'll we'll change that pretty soon. So um, we're here to talk about government. Uh, I'm gonna start to. I think everyone has has the paperwork, right? You guys have the worksheets. So we're gonna start with one where we start to talk about first of all who represents us. Um, I think everybody knows who the president is, generally speaking, right? Um, does anyone know who their mayor is? Have you guys ever talked to like your, your city mayor? No? Yeah? Okay. Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> of course you have. Um, well, then, all right, we're going to get into this worksheet here, and we're going to start to talk a little bit about uh, who represents us, and then as we're going through that, I'm going to start to talk a little bit about what specifically they do, and we'll start to talk about the levels of government, because we have the national government, but then after that, we have the state government, the county government, the city government, and we're going to go through each of those layers. So why don't we start with that worksheet? Uh, this worksheet is called Who Represents You, if you want to pull it out. Everyone found it? Perfect. So, we've got a few blank squares here. I'm going to help us with the national one, and then I'm going to turn it to you guys to, uh, to fill out the rest of it, and then we'll come back as a group and start to talk about it. So, like I said, there's different layers of government, and each layer of government has a different set of responsibilities and it has a different group of people who run that layer of government. So we start at the national level. Obviously the national government, uh, also known as the federal government. Are you guys familiar with that term, federal, federalism? Yeah? So the federal government controls things uh, for the entire United States. From there, you go into the state government, which, you know, for us, they just focus on issues specific to California. And then you have your county government. We're all in Alameda County and, or Contra Costa County for some of you. Um, your county government will look at issues specific to your county. And then it boils down to the city, um, you know, 
that's uh, that's kind of the the four layers that we generally focus on. So the national government has an executive. An executive meaning that there's one person who is kind of the leader of the national government. Uh, everyone knows who our executive of the national government is. Raise your hand or shout it out. Who it is? Joe Biden. Yes, it's your president. So in that first square there, we're going to put in uh, the president and we're going to put in Joe Biden. Um, and you can see in the square next to it some of the, the powers that that executive has. So the biggest one in the United States is that you have control of the military. Uh, and so they're called not only the president, but they're also called the commander in chief. Commander in chief meaning that they command the armed forces. Apart from that, they also oversee Congress. Um, they get uh, a lot of different uh, appointments. So they get to like send ambassadors across the world uh, to represent the United States and our interests. Um, they give what's called a State of the Union, uh, State of the Union address. So every uh, every year they will have to give this speech on kind of what's going on in the United States uh, and their perspective on, on uh, how to improve the U.S. basically. Uh, and then they, you, you can read in that, in that square uh, the other powers that they have. Now, um, are you guys familiar with Congress? Do you guys know, have you heard that term? Do you guys know kind of what they, um, what they do? Raise your hand if you want to tell me a little bit about what Congress does. Otherwise, I'm going to start calling on people. Uh, all right, no one's, no one's even looking in my direction. Do you want to tell us what Congress does? I know, uh, yeah, I know you raised your hand, so. <laughs> Uh, Congress does a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for a great answer. <laughs> so Congress, the, the big thing is that they are able to pass laws. So anytime you want any kind of law passed across the United States, you take it to Congress and they uh, write a bill that bill then goes through the different chambers of Congress that I'll get into in just a moment. And once that passes, it goes to the president. Once they sign it, it becomes a law. So the big thing to always remember is that Congress gets to make the laws. So there's two parts of Congress. You have what we call the Senate and the House of Representatives. So the reason for that is because you want to have enough people to actually uh, debate all of these issues. You don't want just one person making all the laws for the United States. That would be uh, a dictatorship. We don't like those. Um, so we have these two chambers and they're kind of given the same set of responsibilities, but they, they work with each other to be able to come up with these laws and they have to, to negotiate and debate each other. So you have the Senate uh, the Senate is made up of two people from every state in the U.S. So you have 100 members in the Senate. Every, uh, every state gets to elect two people, and they send them to the Senate. That's called the, the upper house. So they have a lot of power. Every state gets to send just two people. The House of Representatives is a lot, uh, a, a lot bigger. So the way that that works is that every state, for every 500,000 people in that state, you get to elect one person that you send to the House of Representatives. So uh, a state like California, therefore, will get a lot more people than a state like Wyoming. And the reason it, that we do that is because we want to make sure that uh, where there's a lot of people, all of those people are equally represented. Um, and so California, for instance, having a lot more people uh, should have more say on the laws that, um, that we try to enact. So we're going to start to fill out this, uh, this paper. Um, we're going to start with the, the House of Representatives. Does anyone know who represents them in the House of Representatives for, for your area here? Yeah. Eric Swalwell. Eric Swalwell, yeah. 
So for most, I think for pretty much everyone here, it's going to be Eric Swalwell. If you live in southern, um, in so, like South Fremont or anything, it'll be Ro Khanna, if any of you have heard that name. But I think for the majority of you, it's going to be Eric Swalwell. Now, can anyone name our two U.S. senators from California? I know this is a, this one's a little bit tougher. I, I, you know, they're they're not as high profile, or they they are, but like, anyone know? All right, how about this? Uh, why don't Why don't you guys Google this? See if you can figure out uh, who our two U.S. senators are for California. And as soon as you know, just raise your hand. Yeah. Correct, yeah. So the two US senators for California are Alex Padilla and Dianne Feinstein. So in those two, uh, underneath where it says U.S. Senate, you're going to write down Alex Padilla and Diane Feinstein. Now, for the rest of this worksheet, I'm going to give you guys like maybe 10 minutes or so. Why don't you, uh, again, Google uh, who your state governor and county executives and city executives are. Fill it in to the best of your ability, and then we'll come back as a group and uh, and we'll we'll discuss it. And if you have if you need any help or anything, just raise your hand and I'll I'll come by and, and help you guys fill it out. And feel free to work together with each other too. Let's start to share some answers, and then hopefully we can we can all fill this out together. So, uh, who wants to uh, volunteer to help us with the the state? Uh, row here. So starting with the governor. Anyone know who our governor is? Yeah? Gavin Newsom. Did everyone get that? Gavin Newsom? Does everyone kind of know who Gavin Newsom is? Have you guys heard the name? Seeing some heads nodding. Okay, great. All right, now let's look at the legislative body uh, with the State House of Representatives. Uh, did anyone? So it's not. It's not actually called the House uh, of Representatives. But did anyone kind of figure out what our legislative body in California looks like and what it's called? Call yes. Exactly. Yeah. So we have a state assembly and a state senate. And uh, does anyone know who your assembly member is? Were you guys able to, to look that up and find it? I, there'll be a lot of different answers, but raise your hand and, yeah. Alex Lee, yeah. Anyone else have somebody, someone else as their state rep? Those of you in like Pleasanton, Dublin, San Ramon will have different people, yeah. Bill Quirk is another one, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Mia Bonta, yeah, if you're up in, in you must be in Oakland. Yeah. Uh, how about, did anyone um, put down Rebecca bauer is that, is that a name? Yeah. Perfect. So you must be in like the Dublin, perfect, yeah. All right, cool. Now, how about, so on, for state senate, they have two lines. It, you, you only have one state senator, um, so you can, you can cross out the second line. But did anyone figure out who their state senator is? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, Stephen Glazer, yeah. Some of us might have someone else. Um, Bob Bukowski, yeah, yeah. Cool. I think that'll be, that kind of covers most of the, um, most of this area. So similar to the federal government, you know, where I said you have the, the Congress has two chambers, you have the Senate and the House of Representatives. 
in, uh, in the state government, we have the same thing. So again, the state government can make laws. Uh, they have to go through the legislative body. And those laws then are applicable to all of California. So, um, you know, if we're talking about, uh, let's actually take a, a, an issue that's, uh, I think, near and dear to all of our hearts, uh, climate change. So there's a lot that uh, we can do to combat climate change, right? Uh, but there's very little being done at the federal government level, right? Trump didn't want to do anything. Biden isn't really doing anything. I think a lot of us who would want to see some stronger protections to protect the environment um, so that uh, you know we're not polluting it, or we're not uh, worsening the situation, uh, the, the federal government really isn't doing anything. So at this point, the state government here in California has stepped in and said, well, we're going to do something about this. And so they, at the state level, have started to pass more laws that are only impact California, for better or for worse, but they want to make sure that we have a some environmental protections, at least at the state level, because of the inaction at the federal level. Yeah. Didn't the Supreme Court actually pass something that stops the Environmental Protect Protection Agency from regulating carbon emissions recently? Yeah, yeah, actually, not even just recently. Uh, this was like three days ago, I, I think. It was this week. Um, are, had, did anyone hear about this news story about the Supreme Court and the EPA? A few people. So there's an organ, does anyone know, um, have you guys heard of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency? Some of us have heard of it, maybe. So that's an agency uh, that the, uh, part of the federal government, and they are tasked with, as the name suggests, protecting the environment. Um, and so Congress passed a few laws to cut down on carbon emissions. Um, you know that that cars need to be a little bit greener, uh, things like that. And the Supreme Court, in all of their wisdom, uh, ruled this week that the Environmental Protection Agency is not allowed to protect the environment, which is bonkers. Um, but that's the state of the country that we live in right now, uh, along with some other very questionable decisions from the Supreme Court in just the last few weeks. They are uh, ruining this country, but I digress. Um, <laughs> Uh, any, uh, so I gave the example of protecting the environment. Does anyone else have any examples of, of laws that you find interesting or that you've heard that the federal government or the state government have, have tried to pass? Anyone? No? Okay, well, um, let me think of... There's another example. How about school funding, for instance? Uh, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but I think you guys can, <laughs> can relate to the fact that schools don't have a whole lot of money right now. Uh, they're just not getting a lot of funding. The federal government has not stepped up. They're not giving any more money to, to the schools, and they're not investing in students. And so the state government now has stepped up and said that, hey, we're going to start to put more money into our schools, pay teachers, get better equipment, bring more technology into the classroom, things like that. So there's a lot of work that can be done even at the state level when you have a bad uh, federal government, when you have a federal government that isn't stepping up and, uh, and doing really anything to tackle these issues. So a lot of power at the state level. Now let's move on to, uh, from there to the county level. So, um, one thing I probably should have told you guys, uh, the county doesn't have an executive. So those first two, uh, two squares, you can, you can just block them out. But the county has a very strong legislative body. Did anyone, was anyone able to Google that and figure out what's the county's legislative body? What are they called? Take a stab in the dark if you're not sure. Yeah? 
Okay, no worries. It's called the the Board of Supervisors. So in the in that square where it says legislative body, you're going to write down Board of Supervisors. Has anyone heard of the Board of Supervisors for the county? Maybe not. You met one of them. Yeah, Richard uh, Richard Valle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, he's it's spelled it's spelled like Val. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, uh, well, let's let's talk about it. So, at the county level, you have uh, you have even more power, right? You want, let's say, um, actually, you know, there's a there's a lot of parts of Alameda County, for instance, that don't have a fire department. I think a lot of you guys might know that, um, especially if you live in like the Dublin area, for instance, you don't have uh, your own police department, fire department, things like that. All of that is done at the county level. So what the county does is that they say, hey, there's a lot of areas here where people need services, but there's not enough people for us to just hire someone specifically for them. So what we're going to do is we're going to pool all of our resources together as a county and we're going to set up a new system where we can start to provide some services. So fire, for instance, uh, is done by the, uh, at the county level. So you have the Alameda County Fire Department um, for any, that protect any, anyone who's not in like a city, for instance. Um, you have the, the Sheriff's Department. Uh, if any of you guys have heard of the county sheriff, that's also uh, controlled by the Board of Supervisors, and they have thing, uh, more powers like that. So they get to do things on a more, uh, more local level. Uh, at the county level, they can pull all of our resources together and give us more services. Um, now let's move into the city. So uh, now everyone's going to have uh, different answers here for who actually represents them. But what do you call the executive of a city? Basically, who's, what do you call the president of your city? Yeah, the mayor, absolutely. So uh, we're going to write down mayor in that, uh, in that square. Uh, anyone know who their mayor is? For, for each of your respective cities? Were you guys able to Google that? Yes. Lily May, yeah, in Fremont we have Lily May. How about for those of you who live in like Dublin, San Ramon, Pleasanton? Anyone want to volunteer? Yes. Union City. Yeah, Carol Dutra Vernacci, yeah. Anyone else? I think in Dublin is it's like Melissa Hernandez, right? Does that sound familiar? Um, and I'm forgetting Pleasanton and San Ramon. I'm forgetting the mayors uh, for each of those cities. So you'll have to Google it. Um, but yeah, so the mayor has uh, even more power, right? At the but at a hyper local level. So the mayor is, like I said, basically the president of your city. So uh, if you have a if you have a uh, citywide police department, fire department, they lead those. Um, your, you know, if you have like potholes or anything on the roads, you or you need a new stop sign. All of these things they sound kind of basic, but to have a functioning city, you need someone in charge of these things who will take care of all of these things. So the mayor is the point person that you go to who helps uh, who helps organize all of this. Now you have you also have a legislative body for your city. Anyone know what that's called? Yes. City council. Yes. So in that third box there under legislative body, you're going to put down city council. Now I'm not going to ask you guys to figure out who your city council members are because there's a lot of them and uh, <laughs> and that'll take a lot of time. But similar to the mayor. The city council has a lot of the same responsibilities. They oversee the budget for the city, for your, your police, fire. Um, in Fremont, for instance, we have our own hospital. So they, um, they help fund the hospital. There's so many things that you need uh, for a well-functioning city. 
Um, the other thing also is that um, they're in charge of bringing more housing to the city and more business to the city. Those are two of the very, very important aspects of what it means to be a mayor and city council member. Your job is to make sure that the city is very attractive for people who want to live there, who want to work there, who want to eat there, uh, who want to raise a family there. All of those things fall under the purview of your city council. So that finishes uh, our first worksheet here. Anyone have any questions? Were there any things that you felt weren't clear on this worksheet? Otherwise, we're good. So everyone has filled it out. We're all we're all set to move on. Yeah, awesome. All right, let's see. Where do we want to go next? Why don't we pull out the local government? information sheet next. Let's let's go with that one. So as you guys are pulling that out, you know, for someone like me, I find a lot of value in local government. I, I think, you know, I as as I was talking about the the things that the local government can do, that the city council and the mayor can do, it's a lot of stuff that you can do and that you have a that you have control over within a city. You have a lot of tax money, uh, a lot of people who you hire uh, to, to kind of help run the city with you. Uh, just as like a point of, of reference, Fremont, for instance, which is not a very big city, do you, do you guys, can you guys estimate how much money, how much tax revenue they, uh, they raise just for, just for the city of Fremont? Throw out a number. Ten million? You think about ten million? Anyone else have a guess? Anyone? Fifty million? You would think so, right? Fremont raises about a half a billion dollars in taxes. Every year, it's it's somewhere between three hundred and four hundred million dollars. Every year, they have, uh, I think, about two billion dollars of assets, give or take, just for one city. That's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. There's only five people in Fremont, or actually now seven people in Fremont who sit in city council. I mean, seven people control almost a half a billion dollars and $2 billion of assets. That's a lot of power, right? For, for those seven people to have. And so you wanna make sure that they're spending that appropriately. Uh, otherwise, you're gonna have a lot of issues. You're gonna have people who are just trying to take that money and pocket it for themselves, which is unfortunately very common. So you wanna make sure that you're holding your local government accountable. And we're gonna to start to talk a little bit about uh, about what our local government does. And on the next worksheet, we'll start to talk about how you guys can actually get involved in local government as well. Um, actually, I'll, I'll give you another point of reference. So the Alameda County Water District, where I serve, um, all we do, our job is to make sure that we have enough water, then we get that water from wherever it is in the state, and we bring it here locally. So, um, yeah, actually, let me let me ask this question. Where do you think most of our water comes from? The water that you drink every day. Where do you think it comes from? Yeah. Down near LA, okay. Sierra Nevada, yeah. So, actually, we don't get any water from down near LA. We do get quite a bit from the Sierra Nevada. We get about 40% of our water from the Sierras. The other 60% or so, uh, well, 40% of it, uh, Sierras, another 40% what we call local water. So that's like rain or, you know, we have a lot of rivers uh, like Alameda Creek that flow through our area. And so we get a lot of water from them. Uh, Quarry Lakes, for those of you who have heard of Quarry Lakes, we store a lot of our water there. Another 20% we get from Yosemite. 
So I don't know if, if you guys know, but Yosemite is actually owned by the city of San Francisco. And all of the water that you get throughout the Bay Area tends to come from Yosemite. So we build these big, big pipes, these pipes that are like, um, I think 40 feet in diameter. So like if you took like eight of me and stacked them on top of each other, that's how big these pipes are. And they bring water from Yosemite all the way to San Francisco. And that's the water that all of us drink on a daily basis. That takes a lot of money. So for the water district, for instance, I, I'm in charge of a budget of about $130 million. So again, a lot of money. And you want to make sure that you have the right people in place who are spending that effectively so that you actually have water, you know, past today. <laughs> Especially in California where we're in a drought uh, almost constantly. So let's get into this worksheet here. Um, there's some questions on here. I'm going to give you guys five or ten minutes. Work as a group. Uh, I want to see some, some interaction, but see if you can fill out as much of this as you can, and then we'll come back together uh, and we'll start to, uh, to answer anything that you guys had trouble with. All right? All right. So uh, depending on what city you live in, I think everyone's going to have kind of different answers, um, but we'll, uh, we'll see what we can come up with. So question number one, what is the form of your local government? For example, do you have a mayor council, a council manager, etc.? Anyone want to raise their hand and volunteer a response? Yes. You have a council manager? Okay. What city do you live in? Arinda? I think, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Arinda is one of the few cities that has a council manager. Awesome. Yes. In Danville? Okay, awesome. I actually didn't know that. Very cool. Yes. For Pleasanton. Okay, cool. Anyone else? I think everyone else, If unless you live in those cities, is probably going to be mayor council, right? So did everyone else get mayor council? Yeah? For like Fremont and Union City, uh, Dublin, San Ramon. I think all of those cities are our mayor council. All right, question number two. When and where does your local government meet? So again, we're all going to have different answers, but let me, let's, uh, let's get a few. Yes? Great. Awesome. Okay, great. Anyone else? Yes? It's the same? Oh. First and third Tuesday, okay. Anyone else? Yes. Awesome, okay. Let's get a couple more. How about anyone from like, yeah, go ahead. Great, uh, that's Fremont, right? How about someone from Dublin? When does Dublin meet? Anyone? Yeah. The first Monday of every month? Awesome. All right. Now, question number three. Are any meetings open to the public? If so, which ones? Anyone? It's actually kind of like a trick question. Yeah. Um, are the open to the public or exactly. Yeah. So public or uh, sorry, government meetings by law, unless there's there's a lawsuit involved, by law, these are all public meetings. So you can basically walk into any time the local government is meeting, and you are allowed as a member of the public, even if you don't live in that city. You don't have to live in the city. It's a public meeting for everyone. And now, primarily because of COVID, uh, um, it, all of these have become virtual as well. So you can join by Zoom. You can join online. In Fremont, for instance, uh, they actually have their own TV channel. So you can watch all of your city council meetings on TV. And if you have any comments, you can email them or call them. 
uh, and they'll, uh, they'll, they'll share that in those public meetings. All right, question number four. How long is the term of office for the elected officials in your local government? Anyone want to take a stab at this one? Yeah? Mayors, two years. Councils, four years. And what city is that for Dublin? Great. Anyone else? I think for most of us, for... Um, for most seats, it's about four years. Generally, most cities will do four years. So I think for all the cities that you guys have mentioned that you you're live in, I think generally it'll be like two to four years, um, most of them four years. Number five, are the members of your local government appointed, elected by district, at large, or some combination? Anyone want to try this one? Go ahead, yeah. Dublin's at large, okay. Anyone else? How about Union City? By district? How about our friends from Fremont? Do we know? By district, correct, yeah. Uh, how about Pleasanton? Not sure. I think Pleasanton is... Uh, is by district is Pleasanton by district now? City Council? Do you know? I'm just curious. Don't know? Don't know yet. Okay, don't know yet. But yeah. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll we'll Google that after. Okay. Then final question for this worksheet, number six. How many members are in your local government? Anyone wanna try this? Yes. Nine members in Danville? Anyone else? Yes. Arinda has five, okay. How about Dublin? How many in Dublin? Five in Dublin. How about Fremont? Seven, yeah. What other cities do we say? Uh, Pleasanton? We don't know. I think Pleasanton is five. I'm pretty sure. Cool. All right. Well, that finishes up this worksheet. So we'll put that one to the side. Uh, before we move on, any questions on that one? Did you guys kind of get a sense of what your what your local government does and when they meet and all of that? Do you have a better understanding? Yeah? Cool. All right. Now we're going to move on to this one. It doesn't have a title on it, uh, but it's the one that has like four columns and one column has a bunch of different issues. So let's pull out this one. And this one, I'll be honest with you guys, this is one of my favorite worksheets uh, because I really get to see a lot of the creativity from, from all of you. And so um, we're going to spend a little bit more time on here. Did everyone pull this one out? Everyone has this worksheet? Fantastic. So like I was outlining to you guys, there's different levels of government. Um, there's different ways that, that people uh, operate in these governments. And then there's different responsibilities that each of us uh, has as just a member of the public or a different way that we can engage with each of these levels of government to make sure that we see what we want to see at the city, uh, county, state, and federal level, right? Because at the end of the day, government is a reflection of us. You know, they are accountable to us. We want to make sure that what we want to see uh, in government, the, the policies we want to see, the laws we want to see, the... Um, the way that we want people to be treated, all of that uh, requires us to, to keep our government accountable. Um, before we get into the worksheet, I'll give you a really prime example of this that um, I think many of you guys may, may know quite well. And it stems from the Black Lives Matter movement. 
Were any of you guys involved in that movement uh, at all? Not surprised that you were involved. Good. Uh, and how about any of you guys? Right by show of hands or... Yeah, do you want to tell me a little bit about your experience and kind of what, what got you interested, I guess? I went to some of the protests, mm -hmm. and um, I just thought it was important to raise awareness about them, too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Wonderful. How about anyone else want to share theirs? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. 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 What a great message. Great message. Anyone else? Did, okay, by show of hands, did I, who else went to some of these protests back in, in early 2020? Just a few? Okay. So uh, let's kind of talk a little bit about why that even happened, right? Um, George Floyd, for instance, didn't live in California. He didn't live in Pleasanton, Dublin, San Ramon, Fremont. Why does it matter to us, right? That's, that's kind of the, the underlying question. What the killing of George Floyd showed us is when we do not hold police accountable for their actions anywhere in this country, doesn't matter where they are, they will take advantage of that lack of accountability. And that is exactly what they did in that situation as well, and in many, many other situations. Uh, but that one was caught on camera, and so we all saw and witnessed what actually happened. So you want to make sure police is just one, f one faction of government. You want to make sure you are holding everyone in government accountable, someone like myself included. You want to make sure that they are actually doing what they say they are doing, and if they are not, we need to be in the streets, we need to be protesting, and we need to make them uncomfortable and, and make sure that they know that they can't get away with, uh, with, with trampling on our rights. So I just wanted to kind of start with that. We're going to go, with, uh, go into a few more uh, issues and talk a little bit about what you can do as a citizen, and we use citizen uh, more as a generic term. We, it doesn't matter if you're not a, a citizen uh, per se, but as a member of the community, what can you do? Then we'll talk a little bit about what local government can do, and then we'll talk about what you can do in combination. So when public and government come together, what can be done to tackle these issues? So let's do the first one together, and I'm gonna turn it to you guys, um, have you guys fill out the rest of it and then we'll come back and start to talk about them. So the very first problem that we're trying to address is that there have been several car accidents at an intersection in your neighborhood. So let's, let's kind of brainstorm here. A lot of car accidents at an intersection in your neighborhood, obviously that makes you feel very unsafe. So what do we want to do to, to try and mitigate this problem, try and address this problem and fix it, okay? Oh, wow. There's a lot of uh, movement, so I guess basically every one of the city kind of took took two of like the stop signs and they were both kind of like just kind of stop signs there. Uh huh. So they kind of all like they were by themselves and they just let other people go. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. And uh, and so it was more just like people understood that they needed to, to yield and to stop. Gotcha. Okay. Anyone else? What do we what do we think as just a member of the public? What what can be done in a situation like this? Yeah. Request the local government do something about it. Absolutely. Yeah. And when we, when we say do something about it, what are we thinking? Like, put up stop sign, cameras. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? What else? What else as a as a member of the public can we do about it? 
No? Okay, how about what local government can do? I think we kind of, we can kind of dovetail off of that. Um, you got stop signs, you can put up a traffic light, uh, you, you know, speeding cameras are very common now as well, things like that. What, what else do you think the local government can do in a situation like this? Maybe like a public awareness campaign, you know, people need to drive slower, be more mindful of, uh, uh, of others on the road, things like that. Yeah. And then, then that kind of leads us into what can they do together. You know, public awareness campaigns require all of us, not just someone telling us what to do, but all of us buying into that. Uh, and so that's one way, uh, you know, putting, once there's a stop sign, we want to make sure that we respect that stop sign and we actually stop and we don't just blow through it. Um, things like that. Okay, do we kind of get how, do we, how to fill out this worksheet then? Want to try it on your own? or in groups. Y'all are hella quiet. <laughs> yeah, please. I'm, I'm encouraging you guys to work together. Uh, this one really requires you to brainstorm. So I'll give you guys like 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll, we'll all come back together. How does that OK. So um, there's quite a few good ones on here. I want to kind of hear what you guys were able to come up with. Uh, as a group. Uh, we don't have to go through this in any particular order. Does anyone want to have something that they they want to share? They think that they came up with a good answer for any of these? We can maybe start there. Any volunteers? Can I call on you? Parks and Recreation, we said that citizens can donate money or request for more of them to be built. For uh, Parks and, uh, parks oh, and parks. Recreation. Yeah, OK. So citizens can pool together money um, and, and actually plan out a park that they want to see. Yeah? Yeah. How about what local government can do? Uh, we said build more of them. <laughs> build more parks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's that's what the job of uh, public government is. Uh, they should be building more recreation and yeah, love it. And how about what you can do together? Um, I didn't really get one for that. I was confused. That's fair. Yeah, you know, not all of these will have an answer in, in every box. Um, did anyone come up with something that they want to share uh, on for Parks and Rec? Can be similar. Can be a totally different answer. Okay, I'm gonna call on. How about how about you? Do you want to share what did, what you came up with for parks and recreation? So I said that after the park is created, then the citizens and both the government can come together to bring attraction to the park. Yeah, okay. That's a good answer. I like that. Great. Okay, how about, let's try another one. Chemicals and fumes from a factory are polluting your neighborhood. Now, this is a very interesting one. Who wants to volunteer some of their answers for this one? Let's start with what citizens can do. Do you want to share? what you put down, what citizens can do for this one. Anyone? Requ sorry? Requ uh, oh, I'm, I'm looking at the next one, the chemicals and fumes from a factory one. File a complaint, yeah. Perfect place to start. Anyone else? Did everyone come up with something similar to that then? File a complaint? Yeah? How about what local government can do? This is pollution. What can, what can your government do to help with this issue? 
Do you want to go? Pass more environmental laws? Absolutely. Absolutely. What else? Yeah? For, right, right. So force them to move the factory where, you know, there's fewer people who live there. And so there'll be fewer people who actually have to breathe in the harmful chemicals and fumes. Absolutely. Anyone else? Do you want to share your answer? No? Okay, fair enough. How about what, what can be done together? If you bring the public and local government together, what can you do to tackle this issue? Anyone come up with anything? One of the answers that I've heard in previous sessions that someone suggested was help organize a boycott. You know, if, if this is a, a company that's ruining your neighborhood uh, and they're polluting your, your environment, then why should you give them your business, you know? And so they suggested you can work with your local government uh, or even just your, your uh, community groups to boycott that company and stop buying their products, which I thought was a very, very interesting answer as well. Uh, all right. How about your sister has turned 18 and wants to register to vote? What did we put for this one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah, no, that's that's totally fair. So it's already accessible, and so uh, it's just the job of the individual to register to vote, basically, is what you're saying. I like that. Okay. Anyone else? So, you know, for this one, I think one of the things that um, to always keep in mind, and, you know, we were talking about the Supreme Court earlier and some of their ridiculous decisions that they've passed. Just because you have a right today doesn't mean that that right will last forever. You always have, want to make sure you're protecting your rights. You want to make sure that um, if you are registered to vote, that you are exercising that um, that right. You are actually going out and voting. Voting is one of the most important things that you can do and one of the easiest things that you can do. But also, always keep in mind, there are people who are trying to take your vote away. So luckily not in California. In California, we're actually looking at laws to uh, reduce the voting age. So they want to make it legal for 16-year-olds, uh, 16 and 17-year-olds to vote uh, pretty soon. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to pass that. But there's others, uh, this is not a state issue, but in, in other parts of, uh, uh, of the country, they're advocating the federal government to actually raise the voting age. They, they don't want 18-year-olds voting. And so that would, that would impact people like you. As soon as you turn 18, you want to make sure that you actually maintain that right to vote. So just something to keep in mind as well. Um, let's see. Okay, how about the last one? There's been more crime committed in your neighborhood recently. So what can citizens do? If there's, if there's a rise in crime, what can you do as citizens to try and combat that? Anyone? Do you wanna, can I call on you? On either of you? You want to raise awareness, yeah? That's, I mean, uh, that's the perfect place to start, right? If there's crime in your neighborhood, you want to make sure that your neighbors are aware of that and that they're taking the good precautions. Yes? Do you think this is more like a neighborhood watch? Mm -hmm. Like neighborhood, yeah, you could start a neighborhood watch. Absolutely. Yeah, those are uh, actually more common than you would think. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of different neighborhoods will come together. Um, a neighborhood watch basically is like all of your neighbors coming together and saying, hey, uh, one night a week, I'm going to stay up all night. And I'm going to walk around the neighborhood 
uh, and just make sure that I don't see anything suspicious. You, you got to be a little bit careful with these things, but uh, you know, if there's a violent person in your neighborhood, <laughs> you want to be uh, alone and get shot, you know. Uh, but yeah, neighborhood watch is a good idea. How about what local government can do for this one? Yes. Uh, more law enforcement, yeah, getting more police uh, to, to watch the area uh, that's actually affected, yeah, yes. Putting more lights in the area, absolutely, that's a great deterrent, you know, the, if there's more light, it's, uh, it's harder for, for people to commit some of these crimes, yes. Put up security cameras, absolutely, yeah. All great ideas. Anyone else? How about what you can do together as, as a more holistic community? Is there anything else that, that you want to add to this? No? Did everyone kind of come up with some similar answers on this one? All right. Those, I think, are some of the more interesting ones on this one, unless anyone wants to add anything from this, I think we can call this worksheet complete. Yeah? Cool. All right, so I do want to be cognizant of time. I think we only have about five minutes left, so I think we're going to kind of end it there. There are a few more worksheets uh, that you guys have. Uh, I encourage you to, to go through them on your own time and, uh, and fill them out and you know, see what you find interesting. On, a, on an ending note, um, first of all, did you guys learn anything today? Maybe by a raise, raise your hand if you, if you felt like this was a, a useful session and if you walked away learning something that you didn't know otherwise. Yeah? Awesome. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad to see that. Um, you know, as a parting note, local government is often overlooked, and I know um, I know sometimes it can be like, oh, it's really boring and this, that, and, and, and all of that. Uh, but just, just know as you guys are getting ready to vote, uh, as you guys are, are coming of age, you know, there's a lot that you can do at the local level to have a positive impact on your community. And that's really where it starts. It always starts at the local level. So we, we might always have our frustrations with the federal government and, and all of that, but always know that if you want change, change starts at home. Change starts at the local level. So I, I, I hope and I encourage you guys um, to stay active in your local government. Always, always, always remember that you have to keep your local government accountable. You always need to keep these guys accountable. Um, well, at every level of, of government. Um, I hope at some point maybe you guys will be interested in running for office. Always know that people like myself and, and other um, elected Muslims will always be there to support you guys and, and encourage you guys. And so whatever we can do to help facilitate that, you should always come to us and let us know. And always remember that you have great uh, civil rights organizations like CARE and others who are doing a lot of work to protect the rights that we have. It's very, very important. And we're learning what you know the Supreme Court and and bad legislators can do and the rights that they can take away from us. We want to make sure that we're protecting rights, not just for us as Muslims, but as Muslims, it's incumbent on us to protect rights for everybody, right? And so uh, just always keep that in mind. Um, yeah, and, and uh, any, any other questions that you guys have, you can always reach out to me. Um, I care and, and everyone has my contact information. And so I think, I don't know if you guys shared that with them, but... Um, you know, anytime you guys have any questions or anything, just reach out to me and I, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to help. But I think that's where I'll, I'll conclude today. Um, and just a little bit about me. Um, I am a community advocate. I currently serve as the Advocacy Director at Alliance for Girls, which is a nonprofit. So I do policy advocacy for my full-time job. Um, I'll be going to grad school uh, next month uh, to study public policy as well. And I'm also an appointed commissioner on the Alameda County Women's Commission. 
So that's kind of my background and what I bring today. And feel free to pause at any point if you have questions or um, you want to uh, raise anything. I think everyone here has a lot of experience and knowledge with advocacy in different forms, as you'll come to know. So I want to hear from you all too about what you think and just have all the knowledge that we have in this room here today. So first we will go over what is racism um, and I would love for someone to read the definition. So any volunteers? What is racism? A socially constructed system of oppression that is rooted in anti-blackness. It manifests, it manifests in the dehumanization of people of color, abuse, and genocide, and is based on a hierarchy that informs structures of power among all racial slash ethnic groups. The practice and underlying belief that blackness, its history and rich culture is something to be denied, belittled, oppressed, and hated. It is both systemic as part of policies and institutions, as well as interpersonal as, as we have seen in cases of bias and discrimination. Who's heard of the term anti-blackness? Anyone familiar with it? I see a few hands. Yeah. I feel like during the pandemic, that was a very critical conversation that we had as a country. Uh, not a new conversation, but I think the pandemic really forced everyone to pay attention and focus on that. So when we talk about these issues, part of why I bring it up is because the way that anti-blackness and racism show up is in the cycle of oppression. All of us are inherently impacted by racism in one way or another, um, and whether we're benefiting from it or we're, we're being impacted by it directly. Um, and so it's important for us to understand this when we're doing advocacy and organizing um, so that we can have that lens and framework when we're approaching key issues and also be mindful of our own positionalities right, and how we're coming into this space. So the cycle of oppression here kind of helps us understand um, how does this continue to perpetuate in a circle? And, and then when we understand that cycle, we can also understand how do we break that cycle. So this is kind of the cycle here as it, in a, a circle kind of space. Um, and I'll go back to the previous slide because it has some of the definitions of the terminology that you're seeing. Um, but you can see the circle here that starts with um, stereotype, prejudice, discrimination, institutionalization, and internalization. So going back, you know, I just want to make sure we have the definitions, right? When we're talking about oppression, um, we're referring to policies, practices, and norms that systemically exploit one social group by another for the dominant group's benefit. So that's just broadly speaking to oppression. And oppression is something that we can see in, within the context of gender-based violence, racism, ableism, and other forms of discrimination. Um, and so when you see the cycle and the way that it kind of goes in a circle and now thinking of how do we break it, it starts with a stereotype. And so we often have a fixed image or traits widely believed to represent all members of a particular community. Um, we're all familiar with stereotypes, unfortunately, about Muslims, right? Muslims are terrorists. Those are as an example of a stereotype, right? It's not true, but it is a widely uh, fixed image that people believe to be true. Prejudice is a preconceived opinion or attitude that is not based on reason or actual experience, and it's often connected to someone's perceived identity. Um, I say perceived ident identity and emphasize that because people often uh, make assumptions, right? You see someone on the street, and you know we've seen this a lot with our Sikh community, right? When someone sees a Sikh person, thinks, "Oh, that that person is Muslim." It's their perceived identity, right? That person's not actually Muslim, but as a result of that, they're gonna direct their prejudice towards that person, even though it's not based on any real fact or real experience. Um, and then discrimination is an action or practice that ex excludes or disadvantages an individual or group based on perceived identity. So this is now someone's actually taking you know, action towards something, right? There can be something that you internally believe, um, but then acting on it is when we see different forms of discrimination. And then institu institutionalization when we see how these practices and beliefs are actually embedded um, within systems, right, within um, structures of government, um, of local leadership, within organizations and organizational cultures, and actually changes, um, you know, 
impacts outcomes and policies for communities and for people. And then finally, it, you see the cycle ends with internalization, which is to accept and embody a norm, value, attitude, or behavior established and reinforced by cultures and institutions through socialization, active learning, or unconscious assimilation. So at that point, you know, we're, we have uh, prejudice, we have, there's a stereotype of fixed image that's been reinforced through media or through other forms of culture. It then becomes something that we may act upon through discrimination, whether conscious or unconscious. It gets adopted by institutions um, and local governments, and we see it show up in policies that's actually impacting people. And then the internalization is when we see that and we think, oh, that's normal, right? This is what it is. Because everything around us in, is reinforcing that this is normal and this is acceptable. So we see this show up for many communities, right? And we're going to be talking about this, you know, within the focus of um, anti-black racism and how we see that show up in our own communities, right? Because especially, you know, in the South Asian community and in, in non-black people of color communities, right? Which I um, think is important to highlight. We're not exempt from anti-black racism. We're not exempt from being racist, um, whether it's within our own communities or to other communities. Um, and so we have to take that moment to pause and reflect and look internally. Um, one of the uh, ayahs from the Quran talks about, you know, stand firm in justice, be it against yourselves or your parents. And I think that's really profound because it's asking us to look internally and think about how are we ourselves perpetuating injustice and how do we address that internally and then within our family and our immediate community. So that's why it's really important for us to have that conversation and really think about that. I think often in this country, the conversation is very black and white. There is not so much conversation on what about the people in the middle, right? You're, you're not black, you're not white, but you're still uh, involved in this situation, right? We still have um, been, you know, we have a history of South Asians and non-black people of color perpetuating racism. And then there's also a history of non-black people of color actively being comrades, right? Standing in allyship, we see people like Yuri Kochiyama or Grace Lee Boggs. Um, and I would also recommend all of you check out the Berkeley South Asian uh, Radical History Walking Tour, like kind of learn more about the history of South Asian activism. Um, but I bring that up to say like, we are also part of this and that's why we need to pay attention. So when we think about this cycle, right? This is something that, you know, at at one point, I would love for us to reflect on, you know, how do we break this cycle and what's keeping us in this cycle, right? How do we actually stop this perpetual cycle of oppression? Um, and so that also transitions into, right, like, what is our role? How do we actively address this issue? And what does that look like? So allyship is a concept that you may have heard of. If you have, raise your hand. How many of you are familiar with allyship? Yes, I see some of you. Um, and so allyship is something that allows us to really think of how are we standing in solidarity with an another community? And it's not a term that like we self-proclaim, right? I don't show up like, hi, I'm an ally, right? We don't, we don't do that. But it's how do we show up through our actions, through our words, through our intentions for another community um, and be able to show up in solidarity, take the leadership of another community um, when addressing an issue. So there are some reflection questions, you know, around like, what does allyship mean to you? And what are some words that come to mind when you think of an ally? So I'm sure all of us can even share examples of times where someone has been an ally to us, right? As Muslims, we often face discrimination or Islamophobia. And there may have been times where, you know, whether it was in the news or you personally, someone came to uh, support you and be your ally. So I would love to kind of get a sense of examples if anybody has any, whether it's your personal life or it's just something that you saw in your community. Um, so, I think for me, allyship is kind of like, you know, throughout our lives, we, most of us might have experienced, like, discrimination or Islamophobia sometimes, so, at some point in our lives, so, um, I think I remember one time when, um, one of my friends, you know, and that too, one of my close friends, kind of, got into that path of like believing Muslim stereotypes and kind of started judging me for being a Muslim. And so just seeing my other friends, even though they were non-Muslim, stand up for me and, you know, just like help me feel better and kind of explain to our other friend that, you know, that's not how it is. I think that could kind of be considered allyship. Yeah, that's a great yeah. example. Thank you for sharing. And I'm sorry you went through that. That's okay. I'm glad you have friends that, um, 
we're allies, right? That they, without you having to say anything, we're able to say, let's, let's step up and do something about it. You want to share what it maybe just attributes of a good ally? Uh, so I guess some good attributes are like they come to your help when you're like in trouble mm -hmm. and with like out asking and then maybe like they check up on you and like see how you're doing and if you need help then yeah. Yeah, that's great. The follow up, right? You're making sure that you're actually asking the person, you good? Because it's at the end of the day about the person, right, who's impacted. Um, I think the most important like attribute of an ally should be the fact that they've uh, been through what you've been through. Mm -hmm. like. A kind of empathy for you because they've been in your shoes so mm -hmm. that's like they can um comfort you better if they've if it's like relatable right yeah being able to relate to like the human experience and the human emotions yeah. and we got one more behind you uh and also i mean if you're trying to help someone out who's facing discrimination or like and you haven't necessarily faced their exact kind of discrimination or you're not from that ethnic group or what have you um Humility is incredibly important because a lot of the time people will sort of take the struggles of other groups and act as though this is, uh, they're like the savior of this group or something like this, right? Um, so I think humility is the thing that I'd say is most important now. That's great. I really like that one because it's reminding us, right, even if we don't have the same exact experience, we're not coming in to say, oh, I'm saving someone. At the end of the day, it's about how does a person who is most impacted, how are they feeling, right? Um, and so when I think of allyship, I think of, okay, how are we taking leadership from the people who are from the impacted community? Um, how are we receiving feedback? You know, are we hearing when they tell us, mm, that wasn't the best way, Halima, like you should have done it a different way, or can you actually do this, right? Am I actually listening to that and being uh, humble about taking that in? So those are great. Um, I would say, you know, allyship is an ongoing process, not something that at any point we say like, oh, we did the thing, I'm an ally, you know, I'm going to pat myself on the back. And, um, you know, in the context of anti-black racism, I want us to really think of how do we prioritize um, taking leadership from black communities, prioritize the calls to action that they're asking us to do, right? And um, during these last couple of years, the calls to action for defunding the police and abolishing the police have continued to increase, right? So that's a call to action that we have to think of. How are we supporting that? Maybe it's me educating myself on what does defund the defunding the police mean, right? And then looking into locally, what are ways that I can support that? That's one example. I think it also requires us to think of shifting power um, dynamics. As people who are not black, we hold a certain level of privilege. And so when we're stepping into how do we address an issue that we're inherently benefiting from, whether or not we, we want to or not, um, we have to think of what are we willing to give up, right? There's going to be times where we to shift power. How am I giving power back? And what am I willing to do uh, for things to happen? There might be times where in solidarity with another person, you know, I, I'm, I was asked to actually speak at an event um, with another person and we were both being paid to speak at this event. And the, the other person was uh, censored and removed from the event because of her support for Palestine. And so in solidarity, I said, I'm not speaking either. And the sacrifice was, I didn't get paid, right? But I was willing to make that sacrifice. So knowing what you're willing to sacrifice is important because there's going to be moments where you're going to have to make that decision. I think it also just, you know, just thinking of power dynamics, right? When are opportunities where we can say, oh, I was being asked to do this or someone gave me this power, they gave me the mic, but I'm going to pass the mic to the impacted community. I'm going to give that power to someone else. Um, so really thinking of how we're able to shift those dynamics. Um, donating your time, right? This is something that all of us can do, especially during the pandemic, right? And we have a little bit more time back, hopefully. Uh, being able to support community organizations through whatever skills you have. And it sounds like all of you have some great skills, right? Baking, um, having a book club, doing painting, doing all, you know all kinds of stuff. These are all ways to either fundraise or create community spaces where we can educate ourselves and each other. Um, and so all of us have the power to do something, right, at a local level. And then being open to taking the feedback. It can be really hard right, as humans, when someone gives us feedback and says, oh, you didn't do that right, or, uh, you know, this didn't land well. And especially when we have good intentions, but we have to be willing to 
take that without getting defensive um, and take that as a gift. I personally see that as a gift, right? If someone comes to me and says, your impact Halima wasn't, you know, didn't land well for me, this hurt my feelings or this caused some harm, being able to take that in because someone actually took the time to be brave and tell me this, or right? it's not easy to give that feedback. So being able to take that feedback as a gift and to be able to think of, you know, how do I uh, reflect on that and improve myself? And then um, finally thinking of like, where do we best fit in, right? All of us have very different roles that we can play. And when we close out, we'll talk about the different kinds of roles in uh, social change and advocacy and organizing. And also thinking of like, where do you feel like you best align, right? Each of us have a very unique set of skills and gifts and talents. Um, how do we best use that for uh, making social change? So let's see, I think we kind of already talked about this. So I'm going to skip to the different ways of making social change. And you all also have um, some of this information kind of written in your uh, packets or your handouts. So you should be able to kind of look through that there. Um, but there's a couple of different ways that you can make social change. And I would love to hear from all of you too as we go through this if you have experience with any of these different models whether you've been involved or you've benefited from them uh, the first one is direct service and direct service is you know when we're able to get a, a service from someone maybe it's uh, I'm going to a legal clinic because I need help um, figuring out some paperwork for the lawyer um, maybe I'm going to get a COVID-19 um, vaccine or uh, get a COVID-19 test, right? That's a direct service that's being provided by community organizations, um, governments, and um, other individuals. So we're just getting that one-on-one -on -one service. Um, and in this model or in this structure, we're not really looking to change the system. We're looking to provide someone with uh, a solution, some kind of immediate relief, right? How do I provide you with some help now right, with recognition that there might be changes on the larger level that need to be made. But right now, this person needs housing. So how do we get them housing? Or this person needs to get the vaccine now. Even if they don't have insurance, let's get them their vaccine. So direct service is really looking at how do we provide that immediate service. CARE is a great example, right? They're providing direct service um, by making sure they're providing legal aid and support for people, right? Um, and then self-help, that's one where someone individually seeks out I need help, I need to figure this out, and I'm gonna find my own path to do that. How many of you have tried the self-help avenue? Maybe it was, you know, you need a tutor, or you need extra resources for your class, and you're like, I'm gonna seek it out myself. I will go on the internet and find something, right? We've all been there. Um, education, so this is one way that we can start to go into the, more in the spectrum of how do we change something, Right, whether it's educating ourselves or educating others, but it is really trying to get more information. It can look like raising awareness, right? We've seen awareness campaigns, education campaigns, um, addressing like, for example, um, let's talk about the narrative of Muslims in this country, right? That's like an education or awareness campaign effort that's trying to shift the power, shift the stereotypes, shift prejudice, and hopefully be able to address the ways that these get institutionalized in policies and practices. And then you have advocacy, and this can look like um, CARES uh, Advocacy Day at the Capitol, right? When we're all going and advocating for certain bills and telling our elected officials, these are the things that we care about, these are the bills and policies that we need you to pass and support. Um, advocacy can also look like you advocating for your sister or your brother to go, um, you know, maybe you're like, we all need boba and parents are not taking us to it, we're gonna advocate together for each other to go get this thing, right? Um, and then finally you have organizing, which is really looking at direct action. And that's, you know, on the uh, other end of the spectrum, we're really looking to shift things. So we're saying as a community, we've decided that we're gonna organize to shift a policy um, and to make systemic change so that this issue no longer keeps happening, right? So we're trying to get to the root cause of the problem. Any questions about this continuum of social change or things that people wanna add? We have just in the room, um, but yes, here, this, this kind of goes over what I just mentioned, you know, direct service, we have self-help, um, education, Let's see, advocacy, who remembers Hassan Minaj testifying? I love when he testifies, it's always so funny and so on point. 
Um, and then you have organizing. This is a group that I really would recommend people check out. It's a great way to get involved. It's called ASATA. It's the Alliance of South Asians uh, Taking Action. They've been around for a long time and they do a lot of great solidarity work with other communities. So I would uh, highly recommend them. So we'll go into the activity now. So could I have somebody read the statistic on the slide? White students are 1.3 times more likely than black students to be enrolled in AP classes. And white students are 1.7 times more likely than black students to be enrolled in gifted programs. Thank you for reading that. Um, I want to show a quick video. I'm just double checking that we have sound when we share this. The mold, the carpet, the walls itself, the classrooms, the teachers, everything that you need in the school or could use in the school is not there. At this point, it's just like a daycare for teenagers. Students at Block High School in rural Louisiana say conditions at their school are so bad that they're struggling to get an education. And what you see right here, if you look closely, it got some on um, the water that's been leaking. That's turning the mold, like when you go in the classrooms, you can smell it. That building there, B building, it is completely unsafe, but we still do go in there as far as using the auditorium. These are the textbooks they were given at the beginning of the school year. Teachers across the country continue to go on strike, but public education in rural areas gets little national attention. We traveled to Catahoula Parish, Louisiana, one of the poorest parishes, one of the poorest states in the country, to see why students are speaking out and what conditions in Deep South schools are like more than six decades after desegregation. Um, they try to make you a world history teacher, geography ACT. teacher, and a ACT prep. And a standardized test yeah. prep teacher. Mm -hmm. And are you certified for any of that? I'm only certified in physical education. Their athletic coach, Benny Volt, inspired his students to speak out. I taught history for a little while. I taught, uh, I taught the amendments. And you know, the First Amendment is you have the right to protest. They made you teach history, so you said, okay, I'll teach them history. I'll, I'll teach them the history I, of protest. I, I, I teach them the history of protest. Coverage tonight of the protests at Block High School. We got teachers that are not certified teaching subjects that they don't even know. If you're a teacher and you don't know what you're doing, how you expect me to do? Block High School is situated in Jonesville, the poorest section of Catahoula Parish. Nearly 70% of seniors are black and about 60% of students here do not go on to college after graduation. But 13 miles away, there's another school in the same school district that looks a lot different. Nearly 90% of the senior class here is white. They perform better academically and enroll in college at a higher rate. So we just tried to film inside Harrisonburg High School, but the superintendent won't let our cameras inside. They don't want the principals to talk to us on camera. But there's a clear, notable difference in how the school looks compared to Block High School. Dr. Gilly Freeman is in charge of all schools in the district, including Block and Harrisonburg High School. When we talk to students and we talk to families at Block High School, they compare it to Harrisonburg. They say Harrisonburg has beautiful facilities. Why do you think they're saying there's such a difference? Several of the other schools, communities with past bond issues, specifically around facility renovation and refurbishment, and in the recent years, Johnsville hasn't passed any such issue to address their schools. Freeman says that the state of Louisiana gives a set amount of money to school districts, but individual towns can raise additional money by issuing a bond or a tax. What this has allowed them to do um, is to create inside a single school district high schools that are really inequitable in terms of their funding when it comes to facility maintenance in a way that creates schools that are economically segregated and racially segregated. Belinda Davis is a public policy professor and education advocate at Louisiana State University. We showed her video from inside Block High School. The entire school board of Catahoula Parish ought to be ashamed that they have a school in that district that is in that kind of shape. Do you think it's fair 
the system as it is right now. Well, that's a perception issue. Overall funding for public education for a district has reduced over the period of time. The demographics and the population of our parish uh, has decreased, and quite frankly, because of economic conditions, uh, a lack of business and industry. So I'll pause there because the video is seven minutes long, and I, I want to be mindful of time. Um, but just looking at this video, right, we're able to see some examples going back to the cycle of oppression, right, of institutionalization, of prejudice, of stereotypes, and how these are manifesting into outcomes. So I had a few reflection questions, you know, for you all to kind of think about. Um, I would love for you to do that in pairs or in groups of two or three. So find the people sitting next to you. Um, and think about how do you think the lack of resources impact student perception of themselves? How does what you saw in the video and the above statistic, which is listed here, impact the long-term academic trajectory for black students? Um, and I want to put the third one just for the sake of time. So just thinking of the first two questions. So find people sitting next to you and we'll take about two minutes, just do a quick quick discussion and then I would love to hear from like a couple of people. All right, we'll bring it back to the front. So there's some really good discussion. Uh, we were just talking about how a lack of resources would actually like make students feel like they weren't good enough, mm -hmm. which is why they weren't being given these resources. And um, when you think you're not good enough, then you don't want to pursue uh, like higher education because you don't think you're fit for it. Mm -hmm. And with a lack of better like facilities, you're not really getting an education, then you kind of think, what's the point of me going here? Right, you're not being set up for success from the, from the beginning. And it was really interesting in the video, right, how they talked about was how the lack of resources were being allocated, right? The, the district was getting one amount of money for, the whole, for all the schools. But then there was this rule that said each school can add additional money if they can fundraise. So that was already kind of setting up this inequity. And if you look at how schools are funded here where we live, right, currently, it is based on property taxes. So that means automatically some schools will have more money and some schools will have less money. And so you can go miles apart and see a completely different outcome. Uh, not because there was any fault of students, right, or if someone wasn't smart enough, but it's because the resources were not being allocated equitably. Can you hear for like one more, two more people? I think for the for the second one, I think if it starts off like for um, for black students, if they start off having low uh, perc a low percentage of them actually graduating, and in the long term, there's most likely going to be just more and more and more people if it stays like this. Mm. Right, so just thinking of like, what does that mean for the long term for that person if they're not getting a good education, then how that trickles into job opportunities and then how that could trickle into generationally, right, the wealth they're able to accumulate or not accumulate. Um, we're going to go to look at one more example before we do our case study. Um, and so this statistic talks about um, kind of the school to prison pipeline. We see that black youth make up only 15% uh, of the total juvenile population but 58% of uh, youth in prisons. And so that's a huge difference, right, and seeing the ways that black youth are criminalized and punished, um, and also seeing how that ties back into schools. So we'll go over two quick short videos. This is what they call me in school. I was sent home because of how my hair looks. Had a teacher cut my hair off for playing with my braids. Thrown to the floor for sitting at my desk. Black girls are suspended five times more than white girls, but they don't commit more serious offenses. Why is this happening? I'm strong. I'm sensitive. I'm powerful. I'm smart. I'm a leader.
So I think those two videos give us a good example, right? If we're going back to the cycle of oppression, right? We saw how stereotypes, how individual prejudice, prejudice can manifest into discrimination and institutionalization, as well as internalization, right? And so in these videos, we saw the ways in which a prejudice uh, or a stereotype about black students, black youth, right? First, there's like the adult adultification of black youth, where black youth is always seen as dangerous, as older than they actually are, um, aggressive. And those were all the things that the girls in the videos were talking about, right? And the ways in which they were punished and criminalized for it. You could also see in these videos the normalization of carceral language or pro-policing language, right? The ways that we have resource officers or police officers within schools, metal detectors, right? This is a place of education. However, it's being treated almost like it's a prison 